A Braver Version of Me. Book 1 of the Destiny Clark Saga. Written by Cindy Ray Hale. Text Copyright 2019 by Cindy Ray Hale. Production Copyright 2022 by Cindy Ray Hale. Author's Note. This is a rewrite of the original series, The Destiny Trilogy by Cindy Ray Hale. This book takes place during the events of First Portion of Destiny, Book One of the Destiny Trilogy. Scenes and events have been changed and rearranged. I hope you love this version of the story even better than the original. But don't forget, the original story is always available for purchase at smarturl it slash destinybukong. For my daughter Rebecca, whose heart is brave and pure. Chapter 1, Destiny. The stench of testosterone hung in the stagnant air. Nausea twisted in my gut as I climbed the bus steps. Riding to the school retreat as the only girl on a bus full of freshman boys was not how I'd imagined starting my sophomore year. Three rows back, next to a boy with shaggy red hair, I spotted an empty seat. Gripping the straps of my faded, black and purple polka-dotted backpack, I pushed down the aisle, past row after row of smelly boys. Although I kept my head down, their glares pierced me. I took the seat next to the red-headed boy, keeping as much distance between us as possible. He turned away and stared out the window. What's she doing here, someone behind me, sneered. I think it's against her religion to wear a watch, a kid said in a cocky tone. He sounded familiar. I couldn't quite place his voice, and I didn't dare turn around to see who it was. The group of boys behind me snickered. I stared straight ahead, keeping my arms wrapped around my torso as though that would somehow protect me from their words. It wasn't the first time I'd been teased for my religion. I'd been going to Bethel Baptist Academy since kindergarten, but ever since my family joined the Mormon Church eight years ago, I'd been bullied for my religion on a regular basis. The sophomore bus left half an hour ago. Maybe it's against her religion to read itineraries, a third, deeper voice said from across the aisle. He must have hit puberty earlier than the other two. Why does she even go here? I dug my nails into my palms and wished their words away. Why couldn't they leave me alone? I heard the guys get to marry as many chicks as they want. Maybe I should convert. Arrogance dripped from the cocky kid's voice. Yeah, Dr. Robinson would love that, said the deep-voiced boy from across the aisle. Josh, you already have as many chicks as you want. You don't need to stoop to their level to achieve that, said the boy sitting directly behind me, probably with a sneer on his face. A braver version of me would have spun around, looked them in the eye, and told them that if they were going to hate on me, they should at least get their facts straight. I'd explained that Mormons hadn't practiced polygamy since the pioneer days and the people who still practiced had broken off from the Mormon faith years ago. I'd finish by saying that most Mormons thought those people were a bunch of weirdos. It was all very bold in my head. In reality, I sat, stiff as a corpse, as though I hadn't heard a word of it. What do you say, destiny? If I convert, will you be one of my wives? A hush settled over the bus as my brother Michael's intimidating frame filled the doorway. The easy smile and twinkle in his brown eyes told me that he hadn't heard a word they'd been saying. I breathed a sigh of relief. The last thing I needed was my brother getting himself expelled for beating the snot out of the punks behind me. But at least his arrival had shut them up. Michael took a seat across the aisle and a few rows back from me. He ran a hand through his dark, wavy hair and gave me an apologetic look. It was his fault we were stuck on this stupid bus of boys. He'd left his light on in his car all night, and when we'd gotten in the car to leave, his battery was dead. Without Preston, his best friend from church, coming to get us, we probably would have missed the retreat. For the rest of the ride, the boys left me alone. I hid my face in my backpack, willing my eyes to stay dry. I peeked over to where Michael was sitting. He was chatting with Adam Jenkins, a sandy-haired kid who'd sat alone at lunch for as long as I could remember. I'd never seen Adam speak before, and Michael had him laughing out loud. It was like Michael didn't notice there were social boundaries at school. He befriended everyone. It didn't matter whether they were jocks, 
band geeks, computer nerds, student body government officers, or, as in this boy's case, loners. Where did he find the courage to talk to anybody and everybody? Forty-five minutes later, the bus tires crunched onto the gravel road that led into camp. When I stepped off, the humid Tennessee air clung to me. I lifted my hair off my neck and pulled it into a ponytail. Earlier, I'd flat-ironed it until it was silky, but thanks to the heat and the bus ride, the tiny hairs around my sweaty temples and the back of my neck were starting to return to their natural, frizzy state. As Michael and Adam, still chuckling, stepped off the bus, I walked over toward them, and we joined the forming crowd. Dr. Robinson, the new headmaster of Bethel Baptist Academy, stood in front of the double doors of a large building. The boys finished filing off the bus, and we crowded around him. He was a tall man, handsome for his age, with dark hair, graying at the temples, and a broad smile. Everyone quiet down and listen up. Dr. Robinson said in his thick Southern Baptist preacher, drawl. The boys roughhousing to my left stood still and gave him their full attention. All right, the boys' cabins are down the path to your left. You all will be staying in cabin number four. It looks like the luggage van had to stop for gas, so it will be here in the next few minutes. Until then, feel free to look around, but try to stay in this general area. The crowd began jabbering again, and Dr. Robinson raised his voice a notch. One more thing. The girls are staying in cabins down the path to your right and in the rooms underneath the cafeteria. Under no circumstances are you to go down that path or into those downstairs rooms. Am I understood? Most of the boys nodded around me, but one kid called out, so Destiny's staying in our cabin? Score. I shuddered. Ugh. What a pig. Dr. Robinson's eyebrows knit in confusion until he finally noticed me standing near Michael on the outskirts of the crowd. The boys dispersed, and Michael stepped forward to explain the situation to Dr. Robinson. I hung back. Dr. Robinson wasn't exactly fond of Mormons. He'd made that clear when I'd had him for seventh grade Bible class. But, Michael waved me over, and I shuffled over to join them. Destiny, you'll be staying with the sophomore girls in the rooms under the cafeteria. Be sure to check in with Mrs. Smith. She'll be your leader for the duration of your stay here. Michael, you'll be in cabin number one with the other senior boys. You'll need to check in with Mr. Bird. He was lucky. I'd had Mr. Bird in choir last year. He was my favorite teacher at Bethel. Hang tight. I'm sure your luggage will be here any minute. I'm glad to know the two of you were able to make it here after all. Yeah, right. Sure, he was. I considered going to check in with Mrs. Smith, but since I didn't have my stuff, there wasn't really a point. Anyway, the lake was calling to me. I'd been waiting all summer to see it. Surrounded by rolling, tree-covered hills, it was the best part of the camp. I left the road in front of the main building and rounded the corner. The lake sparkled in the sun, a scene worthy of any postcard. Towering pines swayed in a soft, warm breeze. A line of students waited to go down a water slide that was built into the hillside. All the students were swimming in their t-shirts and shorts. The dress code didn't let us swim in front of the guys in our swimsuits. I sucked in a breath and came to a sudden stop. Standing near the end of the line was the headmaster's son, Isaac Robinson, talking to his best friend, Will Green. While they both had dark hair and eyes, Will was thinner, with an angular face and beady eyes. If it was possible, Isaac was even more attractive than I'd remembered. He'd grown at least an inch, and he looked like he'd spent the entire summer in the gym. He raked his fingers through his wet hair, musing it slightly. His gaze was turned from me as he laughed at something Will said to him. Mesmerized, I stepped forward again. I was closer now, but he didn't seem to see me. His chiseled jaw, broad shoulders, and bronzed arms were too much to take in all at once. I stopped next to a giant oak tree with sprawling roots. A few yards away from the end of the line and up a hill, Trevor Wilkins, the quarterback for the Bethel Bears, called out, Hey Robinson! Catch! He hurled the football and it whizzed in a wide arc overhead. Isaac leaped into the air and caught it with a snap. 
Oh, shiz. My mouth was hanging open. I bit my lip. How could I help it? I clung to the rough bark of the tree. Whenever I saw Isaac, my heart raced, and I could hardly breathe. Playing football like a pro wasn't his only talent. He was also an amazing tenor. He was a senior, the student body president, smart, charismatic, and completely off-limits. Hey, Destiny, do you know when our stuff's getting here? Michael's voice interrupted my thoughts. I must have had a dreamy look on my face, because he looked from me to Isaac, and his brow rose. My cheeks flamed, and I looked away. As far as I knew, Michael hadn't suspected anything about my feelings for Isaac. Until now. He shook his head with a smirk and turned to walk back up the hill, just as the baggage van arrived. Adam's sandy head appeared from behind the trunk of a neighboring tree. He scratched a freckled arm and shifted. Hey, have you seen Michael? he asked with a pronounced lisp. He seemed unsure of what to do. Uh, I think he went to check on the luggage van. Adam's eyes trailed up the hill, and he nodded, focusing on Michael standing with his back to us at the top of the hill. He stepped forward, tripped over a route, and face planted into the muddy red clay. Raucous laughter erupted from the football players gathered around Isaac and Will at the end of the line. Did you see that? Trevor doubled over in laughter. Have you seen Michael, he said, imitating Adam's lisp. Adam lay frozen in place in the mud. His glasses were askew on his face, and he didn't even bother to fix them. Adam, are you okay? I knelt down to ask. Then Isaac was there, looking like a heavenly messenger, mere inches away from me, crouching next to Adam. Hey, bro, you look like you could use a hand. The crowd of jocks grew quiet. Sure, Adam grunted. Isaac's bicep flexed as he helped him up. Adam's pale face had turned the same shade as the clay covering him from head to toe. You might want to go take a dip in the lake, Isaac said with a good-natured grin. He slung his arm around the clean side of Adam's shoulders in a brotherly way and walked with him toward the lake. Feminine laughter bubbled up from behind me. Aspen Adams approached with her group of girls, carrying towels and sunscreen. She was a senior and the best soprano in Primus, our school's elite choir. Like always, her blonde hair was styled with precision. Her tie-dyed Primus t-shirt was knotted just above her tanned belly button, and her shorts were slightly shorter than allowed. She was always pushing the limits on the dress code and getting away with it. When you were that good at sucking up to teachers, they tended to look the other way. Aspen's perfection made my stomach churn. I wasn't sure which part was worse, her faultless beauty, her popularity, or her incandescent voice. They were three things I desperately wanted. I especially wanted to get into Primus. I'd always loved music. I'd been playing the piano since I was ten, and I'd been in the church choir for years, but last year I joined the Choral Singers, Bethel's non-audition choir for the high school. For as long as I could remember, I'd always wanted to sing with Primus, but I worried I'd never be good enough. Isaac turned and looked in my direction. His eyes slid past me and landed on Aspen's small frame. His face broke into a smile that rivaled the sunrise. They rushed toward each other, and when they met, he threw his arms around her bare waist just as she locked her arms around his neck. He leaned in, touching his forehead to hers like he wanted to kiss her, but Will said, okay, Robinson, we all get it. You're happy to see each other since it's been, what, 15 minutes? Isaac's cheeks reddened, and although he took a step back, he kept holding her hands. A searing wave of jealousy tore through me. It wasn't fair. They were dating now? As if Aspen didn't have enough already. Now she had Isaac, too? I hated her with a passion that I didn't know I had in me. Unable to stand it any more, I turned away. At the top of the hill, the white van was parked with its back doors open. Coach O'Brien, our balding football coach, was throwing luggage and sleeping bags onto the gravel. Grateful for the distraction, I trudged up the hill to retrieve my possessions. I lugged my gear around the cafeteria building to the basement where the sophomore girls were staying. Inside was a long room lined with two rows of bunk beds. 
Shanice Reynolds, my only real friend at the retreat, sat cross-legged on one of the top bunks with a girl I'd never met. This new girl had long brown hair and bright blue eyes. I took a deep breath, put on my biggest smile, and approached the girls. Hey, guys. Shanice and the new girl were sharing a package of red vines and listening to music together, each with one side of a pair of earbuds. Shanice had chocolate skin and hair, pulled up into a little poof. She pulled her earpiece out and said, Hey. The new girl gave a small wave. I'm Hannah Miller. I returned the gesture. Destiny Clark. So you're new? Yep, I just switched over from public school. Which one? I asked. Acorn Creek High School. I have a couple of friends who go there. Do you know Preston and Megan Nelson? The Nelsons went to my church, and our families were best friends. I know Megan. She and I had choir together. Her brother Preston should be a junior this year, right? Yeah. He's a hottie. I kept hinting to Megan I wanted her to set me up with him, but she never seemed to get it. I was about to comment, but I noticed Shanice giving me a funny look. Her eyes were narrowed as she looked back and forth between our faces with a strange expression. What? I asked. Y'all kind of look alike. Huh? Hannah tilted her head to the side, studying my face more closely. Hmm. I guess so. I hadn't noticed it before, but now that Shanice had mentioned it, I realized there were certain similarities between our features. Hannah's face was a bit more pointed, and while both our hair was long, brown, and wavy, hers wasn't nearly as thick as mine. Her eyes were blue like mine, and her lashes were longer. She was quite a bit bustier, but overall, she could have passed for my sister. Hannah and I fell into easy conversation. Some girls came for Shanice, and she left to swim. So what's the guy scene like at this school? Who do you like? Hannah asked. Normally, I would have clammed up on the subject, but I bit my lip and then blurted, Isaac Robinson. Hannah's eyes widened and a slow smile crept over her face. Oh, I definitely know who that is. You do? Sure. She smiled mischievously. Isn't he tall, with dark hair, and an amazing singing voice? You heard him singing? Um, yeah, I heard him, earlier. Someone needs to offer that boy a recording contract. That's him all right. He has a voice like liquid gold. I knew I was gushing, but I couldn't help myself. He's the headmaster's son, the student body president, and unfortunately, taken. Hannah shrugged. I already have someone in mind for myself, my next-door neighbor, Evan Bellingham. Do you know him? I knew Evan, but not very well. He had sung as a tenor with the choral singers, the general, non-edition choir, last year, so I had seen him regularly, but we had never talked. I don't know him well, but I know who he is. He's a tall, blonde guy, right? Yes. And he has these beautiful blue eyes. He's the one who introduced me to the school. I was getting sick of Acorn Creek and their sad excuse for a music program. When I brought it up, Evan suggested I come to his school. My parents thought it was a great idea, so here I am. So you sing? Yeah. Are you trying out for Primus? Oh, for sure. Shanice told me she's trying out, too. What about you? It didn't surprise me that Shanice was trying out. She had a beautiful, soulful voice. We'd sung together in choral singers. I don't know. It's pretty hard to get in. Well, what's stopping you from trying? I stared at my shoes. Nothing really, I just don't feel like wasting my time, you know? Additions are never a waste of time, Hannah explained. Especially if you work hard to prepare for the audition. Even if you don't get in, you've still grown as a singer. Not to mention that auditioning is a skill that you get better at with practice. I hadn't thought of it that way. Still, I wasn't convinced. Have you ever had a boyfriend? Hannah asked, changing the subject. Nope. 
I've had two different guys ask me out, but I turned them both down. A cunning glint flickered in Hannah's eyes. Well, we're going to change that, starting tonight. Chapter 2, Isaac When I was elected student body president last spring, I thought I had it all figured out. I pictured myself giving a speech announcing all the big changes I had up my sleeve. It would be so inspiring the students would jump up, chanting my name. Yeah. For some reason, it didn't work out that way. Instead, I got the illustrious job of dumping chips and beans on hundreds of plates. Pretty exciting, huh? The student body officers were in charge of serving taco salad for the first night of the retreat. It was lame, but at least it meant we didn't have dishes duty. Aspen dropped a scoop of chopped tomatoes on a pile of lettuce. I said I didn't want tomatoes. I'm allergic, whined a freshman with an acne problem. The camp cafeteria was overcrowded, stuffy, and hot. At the far end of the room, students gathered around a large stone fireplace. Some genius had built a fire in there. I wiped my damp brow with the back of my forearm. Aspen groaned, set the styrofoam plate to the side, and shouted down the line to Will Green, my vice president and longtime best friend, you're going to have to start over with this one. He can't have tomatoes. Hey, babe, are you okay? I asked. Ever since we'd gotten to the cafeteria to set up for dinner, she'd seemed distracted. Aspen flicked a piece of lettuce from her forearm. I'm fine, she insisted. I'm just nervous about tonight. Yeah, right. You don't get nervous. Since she was the chaplain, she was the main speaker tonight at devotional. She shoved my shoulder with a playful smile. Sure I do. If she did, she was a master at hiding it. I'd seen Aspen perform complicated arias, without batting an eye. Something else was up, and I had a good idea what, the same thing eating away at her the entire summer. Two weeks ago, it had only gotten worse. She'd just watched her dad marry some Barbie doll only seven years older than herself. Who could blame her for feeling betrayed? She straightened the rolled-up bandana she'd tied around her head like a headband and dumped tomatoes on the next kid's plate. When I met her five years ago, she lived in a mansion on Walnut Ridge, also known as Snob Hill, not that I mentioned that to Aspen. Last spring, during a weeknight family dinner, Dr. Adams announced he was in love with another woman. Aspen was devastated. After the last of the kids went through the line, the servers finally had time to eat. I scraped together the last pieces of lettuce and dropped them onto my plate. I added a scoop of pinto beans and frowned. The cheese was all gone. Next time I'd fix my plate first and shove it to the side. Live and learn. Since the junior class officers were in charge of cleanup, we were finally free to go. Aspen, Green, and I left the kitchen with our food. I shoveled the last forkful of taco salad into my mouth and got up to toss my plate into the garbage. Next to the garbage cans, Michael was talking to his little sister and the same kid I'd helped out of the mud earlier. I avoided Michael's gaze and tossed my plate. Hey, Isaac. I turned back to him, the muscles tightening around my jaw. Thanks for helping Adam earlier, he said. It was nothing. I shrugged and turned away. Did he really think that after all these years, I was going to talk to him like we were friends? Funny how easy it was to avoid a person involved in almost every extracurricular activity as you. You pretend they don't exist and everything works out fine. I grabbed my guitar from the back of the kitchen where I'd stashed it earlier and went back to the table where Aspen and Will were sitting with the football players and the cheerleaders. All the chairs were taken, so I sat on the table itself. Jesse, this red-headed cheerleader, tried sitting up there with me, but when Aspen shot her an evil look, she backed off. Have you guys heard Isaac's new song? Jesse gushed. I perched my guitar on my lap. As the music flowed, my spirit lifted like it always did whenever I sang. When I'd finished, Jesse leaned close and put her hand on my thigh. Isaac, she batted fake eyelashes at me. I have a huge favor to ask you. Aspen's eyes narrowed. I shifted my leg away from Jesse's hand. What kind of favor? 
I'm trying out for Primus this week, and I'm really worried I won't make it in. I know you're super close with Mr. Bird. Could you put in a good word for me? My eye caught something disturbing across the room. Isaac? Did you hear what I asked? Queasiness washed over me. Aspen gave her a condescending look. Mr. Bird only takes people with real talent. But don't worry. I'm sure he could find something for you to do. I barely heard her. Two figures huddled together at a table with their heads together. Please tell me that's just a coincidence. Chapter 3, Destiny Hannah and I left the cafeteria and followed the crowd down the main trail leading into the woods. Gospel music floated down the winding path. Coach O'Brien was already singing one of my favorite songs. Around a bend in the trail, the camp's amphitheater came into view. Shanice spotted us and waved us over. As we settled into the seats next to her, I saw Isaac climbing down the stairs to the bottom of the amphitheater with Aspen. They sat on the bottom row with Will Green and the other officers. Isaac put his arm around Aspen's shoulders. How did she manage to make a knotted bandana around her head look so adorable? I'd tried that style, and the only thing I'd accomplished was looking like a biker, and not in a good way. About thirty minutes into the meeting, Aspen got up to address us. She started out, pacing around like she was having a conversation with her best friends, telling them good Christians need to witness to non-believers through the Bible's teachings. When she talked about glorifying God by avoiding the appearance of evil, some of the students squirmed in their seats. It was right about then that I noticed something. She had unrolled her shorts to an acceptable length, and her t-shirt was unaudited. Hypocrite. Hannah leaned over to me and pointed out Evan sitting about twenty feet away from us. From where we sat, we had a clear view of his profile. Look at him. He's so hot, she breathed. I grinned. She was so crazy. As the meeting came to a close Hannah leaned over to me and said, I wonder if Evan's a good kisser. I wonder if Isaac's a good kisser, I whispered back. Wouldn't you like to know? Hannah said with a naughty grin. I shrugged. It's not like I could ever get a guy like that anyway. Why not? You're hot enough to get whatever guy you want. You just need to find the confidence, destiny. I shook my head to disagree, but Hannah smiled sweetly and said, that's what I'm for. We need to get you a guy. My parents would kill me. Who said anything about telling your parents? I gaped at her. I always told my parents everything. But I'd never had anything to hide from them before. When the meeting was over, I walked through the tall grass with Hannah by my side. The crickets were singing full blast, and a couple of fireflies had made their first appearance of the night. Gratitude swelled within me for how much I'd been given, a beautiful world, a loving family, a good school, and now a new friend. With Hannah around, I was bolder, happier. It was like I was on the threshold of something great, and Hannah would somehow change my life forever. When we returned the basement of the dining hall bustled with girls settling down for the night. Jesse Larson, my red-headed, ex-best friend, had bunked up with her new friends. She was the main reason I was nervous about coming on the retreat. Ever since she decided she was too good to hang out with me, my life had turned into a nightmare. Last year, Shanice was my only friend, and although she meant well, even she seemed too busy with other girls to give me her full attention. I'd spent a lot of time alone at school during my freshman year. Mostly, I sat on the sidelines wallowing in misery as I watched Jessie live the popular life. I changed into an oversized t-shirt and pink sheep-covered pajama bottoms. Jessie stood at her bunk in electric pink Nike shorts the size of a postage stamp. Her black tank hugged her every curve and showed at least a full inch of cleavage. Jessie took one look at me and gave a preppy, high-pitched noise of disgust. She turned to one of her new friends and smirked. What is she wearing? With a lame attempt at keeping her voice low, her friend said, I think I had a pair of footy jammies with the same pattern on them when I was about five. I turned from her and climbed into my bunk, shoulders hunched. I looked down at my outfit. I felt like a complete idiot. 
I glanced around and noticed almost all the girls around me had on some type of tiny shorts with a tank top. Even the girls with long pants had on a tank top or some kind of form-fitting shirt. There were only a few other girls wearing t-shirts. One of them was overweight, and the other two girls came from families even more conservative than mine. Hannah came from the bathroom in a white tank with neon blue shorts and climbed to her bunk. Even she was dressed like the other girls. She threaded her legs beneath the railing and asked, So where do you go to church? I blinked, processing her question. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I braced myself for the cold shoulder that usually came when I revealed my religion. Hmm, I've never heard of it. Most people didn't know the official name of the church. I could have left it at that, and she wouldn't have realized the difference in our religion. With a firm set to my jaw, I decided to be honest with her. She was going to find out eventually. If Hannah was the kind of person who didn't like me because of my religion, then I didn't want her friendship. Have you ever heard of Mormons? Hannah's eyes widened. You are Mormon? Don't they believe in a different Bible than we do? We use the King James Version. She creased her brow in confusion. We believe in the Bible, but you're probably thinking of the Book of Mormon, I said. Yeah, that's what I meant. I heard it was given to some guy who was visited by an angel. Do you really believe that? I sat up and faced her. Yeah, actually I do, I said, meeting her eyes. Her brow rose and she chewed her bottom lip for a moment before saying, Isn't it kind of weird for you to go to a Baptist school when you're a Mormon? She had no idea. With a blue sparkly fingernail, I traced a set of initials carved into the wall between our bunks. Mostly, I'm used to it. I've done it for the past six years, but it's still tough sometimes. I often heard doctrine being taught that was different from what I was learning at home in church. On the surface, the two religions are mostly the same, faith in Jesus Christ and following his teachings leads to salvation, but in Bible class, the teachers dig deeper and bring up enough differences to keep me on my toes. It forces me to know Mormon doctrine well. Hannah ran her fingers through her dark locks, with a thoughtful look on her face. So, why are you going to a Baptist school? I swung my legs back and forth in the gap between our bunks as I gathered my thoughts. We weren't always Mormons. We used to be Baptists. We went to Bethel Baptist Church. Bethel Baptist Church had been around since my grandparents joined back in the 1960s. About 30 years ago, they purchased several acres of land behind the church and added an academy, which now offered education from kindergarten to 12th grade. Through the years, they had added a separate high school building, a middle school building, a soccer field, a baseball field, and five years ago, they opened a football field. The elementary school met in classrooms that had been added onto the original church building. Hannah froze. You went to church at Bethel, she squeaked. I nodded. When my dad was a kid, my grandparents made sure he was there every day the doors were open. My grandparents are still strong members today. My brother Michael started going to the school when he was in kindergarten, and after two years, I followed and later my younger siblings as well. My dad was a deacon like his dad was before him. Then, when I was eight, we were approached by some Mormon missionaries. Hannah leaned closer over the railing of her bunk. Those guys have knocked on our door, too, but my parents always sent them away. Well, my dad wanted to listen to them. At first, he only wanted to learn about them to prove them wrong. As time went on, we were touched by the message they shared with us, and we felt God's love as they taught. After a year of careful prayer and studying, my family decided to be baptized into the Mormon church. Whoa! What did the people at Bethel have to say about that? The square metal edge of the railing dug into my forearms, so I shifted to a more comfortable position. They were concerned about our spiritual welfare, and they tried everything they could to save us. They even held a special prayer meeting in our honor so we would change our minds and not be baptized. So when you got baptized, you stayed at the academy? I think you'd want to switch to public school. My parents prayed long and hard about it, but they finally decided to try to keep us at Bethel. 
I'm surprised Bethel let you stay, Hannah said. We were pretty worried, but the previous headmaster was cool about it. He told us it would only bring us closer to God if we stayed. I smiled. I think he was right. Bethel's been good for us. What about the new headmaster? Dr. Robinson? I shook my head. That was the problem, wasn't it? I'm not sure what he's going to do. I had him back in seventh grade Bible class, and he was pretty vicious when he talked about Mormons. Hannah picked at a cuticle. Hmm, that must have been awkward. It wasn't necessarily the words he'd say. It was the way he'd say them, like Mormons were dirty somehow. I wanted to quit school altogether. Every time he brought it up, people would turn and look at me like I was some kind of freak. It was the worst year of my life. And now he's running the school? Hannah must have noticed the tortured look on my face, because the next thing she said was, enough talk about religion. Let's talk about guys. Beside Isaac, who else are you interested in? There are other guys? I tried to keep a straight face. She giggled, and laughter burst from my mouth louder than I'd intended. A light came on in the hallway, and Mrs. Smith, my squinty-eyed new geometry teacher, came into the room. I'd never had her before, but Michael had warned me about her. According to him, she was well known for two things, a fiery temper and wearing dresses that showed cleavage when she leaned forward. The cleavage thing might have been appealing to the male students if she'd been in her early twenties, but Mrs. Smith was pushing forty and overweight. Girls, enough talking. Lights out was two hours ago. Yes, ma'am, we chimed. After she left, I heard a swish of nylon as Hannah rolled over in her sleeping bag. Let's get out of here, she whispered, her head close so only I could hear. What? Let's go see what Evan and Isaac are doing right now. Sneak out? I hissed. Shoo. Come on. She was actually serious, wasn't she? How? Through the bathroom window. I noticed it earlier. What about Mrs. Smith? She said the rule was we can't leave after lights out. Destiny, you need to learn something. Rules are made to be broken. My mouth almost unhinged itself from sheer disbelief. Hannah, we could get in big trouble. Not if we don't get caught, she said with a naughty grin. With that kind of attitude, I didn't see how Hannah was going to last three months at Bethel. These people were all about rules, and strict ones at that. She was already climbing down the ladder of her bunk. Don't you want to look back twenty years from now and say you had the guts to sneak out? You're not going to let me have all the fun by myself, are you? I didn't know why or how, but I found myself climbing down the ladder to my bunk as well. I grabbed the pair of shorts I'd worn earlier and sped into them. If we were sneaking out, there was no way I was getting caught in my sheep pajamas. Where are y'all off to? Shanice whispered from beneath me. Come with us, and you'll find out, Hannah whispered. Hannah led us to the bathroom. Near the ceiling was a sliding window with an opening just wide enough to climb through. This is insane, I said. How are we supposed to get up there? The last shower stall has a chair we can use. If I stand on it, I can boost you to the window, Hannah explained in a matter-of-fact voice. Hannah, you're crazy, Shani said. Hannah was already carrying the chair out of the shower stall purposefully. I have a bad feeling about this, I said with fear settling in my gut. Hannah lowered the chair and climbed atop it. Come on, she urged. Against my better judgment, I clambered onto the chair with her. She laced her fingers and offered her hands like a stirrup. This is nuts, I said. I stepped a foot into her hands, grabbing her shoulder, to steady myself. Hannah boosted me, and once high enough, I flipped the latch and scraped the window open. Hurry up, you're heavy, Hannah complained, her hands holding my foot against her chest like a cheerleader in a pyramid. I grabbed an inch-thick tree growing next to the window. It wasn't very strong, and it bent toward me throwing me off balance. Ack. I'm falling. Hands pushed my rear upward, and I got a better grip on the sapling. 
I pulled with all my strength, and with the extra boost, I scooted out of the window. I turned around on my knees and looked back inside to see the dim outline of Shanice scowling. You owe me for that. I ain't putting my hands on your booty ever again. Whatever, just climb up, Hannah said. This time, it was easier because I was able to help Shanice up. She climbed out, and together hoisted Hannah out. Well, that was fun, Hannah said, dusting her hands off. We stepped away from the building into the warm August night. An almost full moon shone in the clear, starry sky, casting shadows across the lawn. A cacophony of insects serenaded us with their nightly summer song. Hannah led the way to the wooded path that ended at the boys' cabins, her feet crunching on the wood chips laid across the trail. Up ahead, I heard a commotion. I yanked the girls into the cover of the trees. My heart pounded in my chest. If I got caught out here, Mom and Dad would kill me. Hudson Brown, Deshaun Williams, what part of don't come out after 10 o'clock, didn't you understand? I recognized the voice of the speaker right away. Dr. Robinson's heavy southern drawl was unmistakable. Classes haven't even started yet, and you've already racked up two demerits for yourselves. Keep up this kind of behavior, and you'll be facing in-school suspension. Have I made myself clear? Hudson muttered something under his breath I couldn't hear. You're to address me as Sir or Dr. Robinson. Yes, sir. His voice was louder, his words crisp. Yes, sir, Deshaun said. Return to your cabin immediately. I don't want to see another slip-up from either of you for the rest of the retreat. Yes, sir, Hudson repeated in the same tone. Their steps moved away, and for a few moments, the only sounds I could hear were the bugs and the frogs down the hill at the lake. I'm going to scout ahead, Hannah whispered. What are you thinking? Dr. Robinson could still be standing right there, I said. Or he could be gone. Don't worry. I'm like a ninja in the trees. Somehow, I didn't believe her. You are not a ninja. Not with the way you were smashing those wood chips under your feet, Shani said. Let destiny do it. That girl lives in the woods. She can sneak up on anybody. You want me to do it? I think we should go back to our bunks, I whispered. I can be sneaky, Hannah insisted. I guess so. If you think an elephant crashing through the woods is sneaky, Shanice sneered. Oh, you did not just call me an elephant. If they didn't shut up, we were going to be caught right here, right now. Guys, be quiet. I'll do it. Just stop arguing. The thing was, Shanice was right. I had an uncanny talent for creeping through the woods undetected. How many times had I taken out Michael and Preston during our paintball games in the forest surrounding our house? I slipped through the foliage, stepping on roots and rocks as much as possible to avoid rustling leaves. The outlines of the cabins clustered nearby. The moon gave enough light to see that the area was deserted. I crept back through the trees to where Hannah and Shanice were crouched behind a fallen log. The coast is clear. Let's go. Who you trying to spy on anyway? Shanice said as we dodged branches. Someone special, I said. Destiny thinks he's a hottie with a naughty body, Hannah snickered. I rolled my eyes at Hannah, although it was too dark for her to tell. All right, I can see you don't want to spill. I get it. The cabin closest to us is where they are, I whispered when we came to the edge of the clearing. How do you know? Hannah asked. Because I heard Dr. Robinson telling Michael earlier. So he's a senior. I like where this is going, Shani said. After a final check of the surrounding area, I said, it's safe to cross to the cabin. Let's move. We dashed across the hard-packed dirt and stopped alongside the rough pine of the outer wall. Just think, Destiny, he could be on the other side of this wall, probably lying shirtless on his bunk just mere feet from us. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Hannah teased. I had to bite my bottom lip to keep the laughter from slipping out of my mouth. Maybe we should ask him to come out and sing us a song with that guitar of his, Hannah said. 
We'd seen him sitting atop a table in the cafeteria, serenading his friends, before dinner. Isaac Robinson? Shanice said. We're here to spy on him? Destiny, you don't mess around when it comes to your taste in men, do you? Destiny has it bad for him. Who doesn't? Shu. Remember? He could be on the other side of the wall. They're not going to hear us. Unless they have a window open or something, Hannah said. A quick glance confirmed the window high above us was indeed open. I could feel my face draining of color in the darkness. I knew this was a bad idea. Well, well, a male voice said from the trees behind us. Oh. My. Gosh. I was going to die right now. Will Green was standing at the edge of the woods. Besides Dr. Robinson himself, he was the last person I wanted to meet outside after curfew. His dad was Dr. Green, the pastor of Bethel Baptist Church. I'd known Will all my life, and I knew what a jerk he could be when he thought someone was breaking the rules. He would consider it his moral obligation to turn us in for our own good. The teachers trusted him so much, they'd probably assigned him to help keep watch. Sorry to interrupt your little get-together, but shouldn't you girls be in bed? Hannah spun around. Shouldn't you? He went on as though he hadn't heard her. So the Mormon girl has a thing for Robinson? Bell rose in my throat. I was going to be sick all over the ground right outside what was very possibly Isaac Robinson's open window. However, just the thought of the smell of my vomit wafting through his window made me swallow it down. Yeah. So? Hannah said. That's. Well, I just have no words for that. Good. Because I was getting tired of hearing you talk, Hannah said. What's your name? You must be new around here, because I don't know you, he said, coldly. Hannah Miller, she said with a defiant glint in her eyes. Hannah Miller. At our school, we speak to each other politely. I suggest you learn a few manners, or I might report this little encounter to Headmaster Robinson. He doesn't scare me. Anyway, what makes you think he'd believe you? I'll just tell him you were out here to flirt it up with the new girl. Hannah flipped her hair over her shoulder with an air of mock seduction. Will leaned in, unfazed. His face was vicious as he said, You obviously don't know who I am, do you? He had a good point. Dr. Robinson would never accept the word of the new girl when his boss's son was standing nearby, contradicting her. No, and I don't see why I should care, Hannah said, glaring at him. My eyes widened. How could she just stand up to him like that? I felt like running and hiding under my covers. Hannah, let's just go. I don't want to get in trouble. I tucked her hand toward the path to our bunks. Will's eyes flicked to me. That's right. You should listen to your little Mormon friend. Only this time, though. Everything else that comes out of her mouth is a lie. You apologize to her, Will Green. Shanice said as she stepped forward. I'm sorry if that offends you, but I won't apologize for speaking the truth. It was an honest warning to an unsuspecting victim. He actually sounded sincere, but that was what bothered me the most. Hannah put her hands on her hips. Well, let me tell you something, Will Green. Destiny already told me all about her church, and I don't see a thing wrong with it. I hadn't told her that much, but her loyalty was touching. That's very interesting. Aren't you just the little Mormon missionary? Well, I can see you won't be listening to me, so I'm going to go to bed. Just like that? Maybe he was going to find Dr. Robinson to report us. We should get out of here, Shani said as we watched, we'll climb the steps to Isaac's cabin. I couldn't agree more, I said. This time, we didn't bother with the woods. We sprinted down the trail to get back to our bunks before we were busted. Chapter 4, Isaac The display of my silenced iPhone lit up the darkened room. I rolled over in the mummy bag I'd just picked up from REI last weekend. Aspen and I'd been texting since we'd separated for the night, but for the last hour, she hadn't replied. I swiped the screen to see her reply. 
I'm going to sleep now, gorgeous. Sweet dreams. All that waiting up, just for a goodnight text? The girl had me whipped. I began a response, but stopped when I heard voices outside my window. Who was out this late? Come to think of it, where was Green? He'd gone to the bathroom a long time ago, and I hadn't seen him since. He'd either fallen asleep on the toilet, or he'd taken off somewhere. Our cabin consisted of a great room, flanked by four bedrooms that were packed with bunks. A wood-burning stove sat at the far end of the great room, positioned between two bathrooms. Silently, I lowered myself from the top bunk and padded barefoot across the wooden planks. I checked the bathroom. Empty. It wasn't like Green to keep secrets. He was the biggest advocate for following the rules that I knew. Well, next to Dad. Green didn't even come close to Dad. Not even many adults could touch Dad's sense of justice. He thought the entire world was going to hell. I was almost back to my room when the front door cracked open and Green stepped inside. Where have you been? I whispered. You'll never believe who I found outside our cabin. Way to avoid the question. Green could have his secrets for now. I was more interested in who was outside. Who? Michael Clark's little sister. She was out there with a black girl and some new girl with an attitude. New girl? Did he mean Hannah? So they were hanging out. My heart sank. I'd hoped that wasn't the case when I saw them whispering at dinner, but then they were sitting together at the devotional and it wasn't looking so good. What were they doing out there? Destiny sure had been popping up a lot lately, like at the water slide earlier, trying to help that goofy kid. She'd always been a cute girl, but she'd gotten a lot prettier over the summer. Green laughed. You're going to love this. There was a thump of feet hitting the floor in the bedroom, to our left. Michael came out and headed to one of the bathrooms. Do you think he heard us? Green asked. I don't know. Let's take this conversation out to the porch before he comes back, Green said. We slipped out the front door. I swept aside some dried pine needles and settled onto one of the rough-hewn steps. I looked around into the surrounding darkness. Do you think they're still out here? Probably not. They seemed pretty anxious to get back. What did they want? Green laughed again. Michael's little sister has it bad for you. I rocked back on the step for a moment. Wow. For real? Too bad she's a Mormon. What was I thinking? I had a girlfriend. I glanced at Green's smug face and forced a laugh. So the little Mormon girl has the hots for me, huh? Wow. God has blessed me. Green laughed harshly. That's not all. Destiny's been poisoning the new girl's mind with her Mormonism. Which new girl? This conversation was headed in a bad direction. The Mormon stole my best friend from me when I was a kid, and I still wasn't over it. Back in the day, Michael and I had been inseparable. We were in the same class, and we always played kickball during recess. After he converted in fifth grade, Dad told me I couldn't be friends with him anymore. Michael had had the hardest time understanding, but Dad had threatened to take away my video games and soccer practice if I didn't stop hanging out with him. He said Mormons believed in a different Jesus and weren't actually Christians. They were all literally going to hell. I thought I could talk Michael out of joining if I just explained that he was losing his salvation. Michael and I had studied the Bible together plenty of times that school year, and he'd always cared what I thought before. I convinced Dad to let me talk to him so I could help. At first, Dad was totally on board. He gave me a list of Bible verses to show Michael, but it didn't do a bit of good. Michael wouldn't listen to any of my arguments. Eventually, I realized the truth, and it still sickened me. Michael had been brainwashed and was doomed to burn in hell for eternity, and there was nothing I could do to help him. Once I realized he wouldn't listen, I knew Dad was right. That was when I started hanging out with Green. He wasn't as cool as Michael, but he'd been a decent friend throughout the years. I think she said her name was Hannah Miller. 
A heavy sense of dread settled into my gut. I was afraid of that. I tried to warn her, but she wouldn't listen to anything I said. She had already sided with the Mormons. She acted like she was best friends with Destiny. She's rebellious, that's for sure. You sound like you already know her. A bitter sound escaped me, more bark than laugh. I do know her. Extremely well. And if what you're saying is true, she's in big trouble. When Hannah sets her mind to something, no one can convince her otherwise. She the most stubborn person I know. How do you know her so well? Green sounded like he was sorry for me for having to have put up with her. She's my cousin. Your cousin? Yeah, her mom is my dad's sister, my Aunt Bethany. Wait, isn't she the one married to the guy who owns the Christian music recording studio? The guy who might get you a contract. Yeah, that's her. They sent Hannah here this year because she's been getting into trouble at school. They thought if she started going here, she'd get straightened out. She's here to reform and the first thing she does is make best friends with a Mormon? Green sounded so incredulous about it I couldn't help but laugh. That sounded like something Hannah would do. She found a loophole in every punishment. It would be her revenge on her parents for sending her to Bethel. Dude, why are you laughing? I don't see what's so funny. I sobered. You're right. It's not funny at all. Hannah's soul was on the line, and I was completely helpless to do anything about it. We should do something. I don't see what, I said. Tell your dad. He'll figure it out. No way. He always overreacts, and then Hannah will do the exact opposite of whatever he says. I rubbed my chin thoughtfully. She's always butting heads with my dad. We have to try something a lot more subtle. Will stood and paced around, deep in thought. Suddenly, he stopped and turned to me. I have an idea. You need to get Destiny to trust you. What if you can get her to open up enough to show you what Mormon are really doing behind closed doors? You know, dig up their dirty secrets. How's that supposed to help anything? I asked. Don't you get it? You take that information and then show it to your dad. Once we have enough dirt on the Mormons, he can take it to the school board as evidence to convince them to kick them out of the school once and for all. And then they won't be around to try to drag other people down to hell, I said. Exactly. It may be too late to save Hannah. But at least we can protect the rest of the student body from something like this happening. You should consider it your job as student body president anyway. I scratched my head. He had a good point. I had a duty to protect the students. I'm not giving up on Hannah though. Well, in that case you'd better start spending more time with them so you can find out what Destiny's actually saying to her so you can set her straight. I have a feeling Aspen won't like the idea of me spending so much time with Destiny, I pointed out. Aspen will understand. She has the responsibility as the chaplain to spiritually protect the students, too. I hope he was right. So are you saying I should take Aspen with me to go see Destiny? I don't think she'd be on board with it. Then don't tell her. Go see Destiny when Aspen's at work. I don't like the idea of sneaking around behind her back. Will shrugged. Sometimes you need to make tough choices for the greater good. Chapter 5, Destiny We raced away from Isaac's cabin into the darkness. When we were halfway down the long trail that led back to the cafeteria, two figures stepped out of the woods only a few yards ahead of us. Deshaun, a sophomore like us, was a tall, brawny guy who'd made it onto Bethel's varsity basketball team his freshman year. Shanice had been crushing on him for years. Last year, he started talking to her a bit more, but they weren't quite to the dating stage. The other guy was shorter, though that wasn't saying much, considering Deshaun's towering height. The moonlight revealed shaggy blonde hair and a wide mischievous smile plastered across an attractive baby face. Although I didn't know his name, I'd seen him in the cafeteria with Deshaun earlier. What are you three doing out of bed? He crossed his arms over his chest in a Peter Pan-like stance. Naughty, naughty. 
Who are you, and what do you want? Hannah demanded. Whoa, take it easy. I'm Hudson, and this is Deshaun, he said, uncrossing his arms. So do you girls want to hang with us? Shanice threw a hand on her hip, gave Deshaun a once-over, and nodded. I'd be cool with that. Maybe. What kind of fun are we talking about? Hannah asked. The kind that comes from hanging with us, of course. Surprisingly, Hudson's smile was awfully charming. Behind us, at Isaac's cabin, I heard voices. I glanced frantically behind us, but the shadows were too dark to see if anyone was coming. Someone's back there, I said. Hurry, get in the woods. Hudson grabbed my hand and led me into the tree line. My first instinct was to jerk it away, but for a reason beyond my understanding, I didn't. A burst of raucous laughter came from the cabin. Michael's little sister has it bad for you. It was Will. He was telling Isaac about my crush. Dizziness washed over me. I let go of Hudson's hand and crept forward over the soft pine needles below. I had to know what Isaac thought of me. Isaac laughed. It sounded forced and awkward, but it was still a laugh. So the little Mormon girl has the hots for me, huh? Wow. His voice dripped with sarcasm. God has blessed me. Will barked a jeering laugh. My face, my neck, my entire body felt hot with a blend of anger and shame. I grabbed Hudson's hand and led him away from the cabin, back toward the group. I hated Will. I hated him and his stupid self-righteous attitude. And now I hated Isaac. I'd always thought he was a nice guy, but this proved otherwise. Are you okay? Hudson asked, trudging behind me. What was all that back there? Who were they talking about? I didn't answer him. I gripped his hand and pulled him closer to Hannah, pushing away pine boughs as I went. Where had Hannah gone anyway? The ground began sloping downward on a steep incline. I heard giggling ahead. They're down at the lake, Hudson said. I can show you an easier way to get there from here. Hudson led the way across the hill to a point where the ground dropped at a gentler slope. When we emerged from the woods, Hannah and Shanice were sitting on a boulder back to back laughing at Deshaun's antics. Where have you guys been? Hannah asked merrily. I overheard Will and Isaac talking, I said, my voice tight. I fought to keep it from breaking. Hannah dropped her smile. What did they say? I glanced at Hudson and Deshaun. There was no way I was talking about it in front of them. They were laughing about some Mormon girl like she was a joke, Hudson said. What? Hannah said, jumping off the rock. I don't see what the big deal is. So a couple of dudes were being jerks again. What else is new? Hudson said. Uh, bro Destiny's the Mormon girl, Deshaun said. Hudson looked a little sick. They were talking about you? Hannah charged forward. That's it. I'm busting into their cabin to tell them what's what. They've gone too far. I grabbed her arm to hold her back. Hannah, are you crazy? You'll get in trouble for sure. You gotta let it go, Hudson said. They were just being punks. Hannah stopped pulling on my arm, deflated. I'm so sorry, Destiny. I feel like this is my fault. It's not a big deal, I lied. It was a big deal, but there was no reason for Hannah to beat herself up over it. The next morning, at breakfast, Shanice led us to the table where Hudson and Deshaun were sitting. Deshaun's face lit up. Good morning, ladies. Hey, hey, Shanice said with a flirty smile. She sidled up next to Deshaun, scooting her chair close. Across the room, Isaac crossed the cafeteria with his breakfast tray. He sat next to Aspen and put his arm around her shoulders. She snuggled into him, her perfectly styled blonde curls crushing against him. Why did I even care anymore? I was so far out of the realm of ever having a guy like Isaac, it was ridiculous to even dream about it anymore. Even he saw how ridiculous it was for me to crush on him. 
He thought I was a total joke, possibly even repulsive. So why did I still care so much? Why did it hurt that he wanted her instead of me? It wasn't like I had any claim on him. So who's going on the ropes course this afternoon? Hudson asked. Oh yeah. Deshaun said, and Shanice raised a hand as she sipped from a straw jetting out of her chocolate milk carton. I'm so there, Hannah said. I prided myself on being an outdoor adventurer, but the suspension in the air thing was a totally different ballgame. Y'all realize that's way up in the air, right? That's what makes it fun, Hannah said in a mock whisper with her hands cupped around her mouth like she was letting me in on some big secret. Are you afraid, Destiny? Hudson said with twinkling eyes. I was afraid. Terrified, actually. But after our adventure last night, something had shifted within me. Sneaking out, despite my fear of being caught, had actually been pretty fun. Overhearing what Isaac had to say about me hadn't been so great, but everything else had given me a rush. It was downright liberating. And I wanted to feel that way again. Hannah smacked his arm. Don't make her feel bad about it. No. I'm going, I murmured. What? Hannah spun around, her hair flying around her shoulders. I'm coming with you guys. Are you sure? You don't have to come along if you don't feel comfortable, Hannah said. I suspected that she took responsibility for any pain I'd felt from Isaac's words. I'm positive, I said with determination building in my voice. It'll be fun. Although she had been the one to convince me to sneak out, I didn't blame her for anything. It wasn't like she'd been the one to make fun of me. I was grateful toward her, because overall, it had still been a fun night. As we made our way out of the cafeteria when breakfast was over, I spotted Isaac talking to Michael by the fireplace. Weird. From what I understood, they hadn't talked since about fifth grade. As though he had sensed me staring at him, he turned and looked at me, Michael following his gaze. I sucked in a quick breath. Were they talking about me? Isaac wouldn't tell Michael about my crush, would he? What if he was asking Michael to convince me to leave him alone? He probably thought I was some kind of creepy stalker, hanging around his cabin at night. The last thing I needed was Michael lecturing me about chasing after the headmaster's son. I adjusted my helmet and stepped a shaky leg from the platform onto the rope, suspended high in the trees. Why had I decided this was a good idea? Up ahead Shanice and Deshaun followed Hudson and Hannah, who bantered back and forth like they were taking a leisurely afternoon stroll in the woods. Miraculously, I made it across the 30 feet to the next platform without hyperventilating. Following Shanice's lead, I hooked myself into a pulley and zip lined across to another stopping point the wind whipping loose tendrils of hair around my face as I soared across the greenery below. I unhooked myself and climbed up a ladder to the platform above where I saw more ladders, only these were horizontal and swinging free from each other like broken sections of a swinging bridge. Shanice and Deshaun hopped across them with ease. I pushed back a wave of nausea and stepped out onto the first ladder. It wobbled, taking my stomach with it. I gripped the overhead rope and crept across two more rungs. When I reached the second ladder, I made a big mistake. I looked down. My head spun, and I tightened my grip on the rope overhead. Shanice and Deshaun had already moved on to the next part of the course and were oblivious to my dilemma. Another climber approached from the zipline to the platform behind me, but I didn't look back to see who it was. My arms began to shake, and the longer I stayed frozen, the more afraid I became. Moisture built up on my palms as I clung to the rope, and my legs shook. Just breathe. You can do this. The person behind me had to be getting annoyed with me taking so long. Destiny, are you okay? I would have recognized his voice anywhere. I looked over my shoulder, and sure enough, Isaac stood on the platform behind me. Do you need some help? My face burned as I recalled his words from the night before. God has blessed me. But that concern flew from my mind when the rope overhead pulled taut as he traveled onto my ladder. The ladder rocked with his weight. I needed to move forward, but I clung to the rope with my eyes squeezed shut. 
The longer you stay here, the worse it's going to be, he said. Eventually, your muscles are going to weaken. You need to keep going. Eyes still closed, I nodded, my head scraping against my vertical arm. You got this. A little voice in the back of my mind whispered, why is he being so nice? Isaac was close now, maybe one rung away. At this point, I wasn't sure which was worse, being high off the ground or having Isaac close to me. I took a deep breath and released it, gathering the courage to take the step. Before Isaac could come any closer, I stepped onto the second ladder. Now that I was moving, it was easier to keep going. I crossed four more ladders and finally reached the platform. See? That wasn't so bad, Isaac said, close behind. I guess not. He was right. Once I'd gotten moving, I'd focused more on the mechanics of moving my body and less on how far away the ground was. My eyes traveled across the rest of the course. My group was way ahead of us now. I took a cleansing breath, determined to keep fear from getting the better of me again. I stepped onto the next portion of the course without hesitation. I heard you might try out for Primus, Isaac said, following close behind. I reached for the next rope. I don't know who told you that, but I'm not trying out. Why not? Not interested, he asked, keeping his voice light. No. I'd love to join. Primus would be incredible. I just heard the competition is pretty tough. I must have sounded so stupid to Isaac. He was easily the best singer in the choir. But he didn't seem to notice. Well, if you decided to audition, what section would you go for? Alto. Good, he said, maneuvering onto the next platform, you'll have a much better shot trying out as an alto. Altos have to pick out some tough harmonies, and there aren't as many girls who can do that. He was right. Even in the non-audition choir, I'd stretched myself a lot to learn to harmonize as an alto. But, according to Michael, Primus singers tackled advanced music with dissonant tones and were required to have a sharp ear to be able to match the correct notes. For the rest of the course, Isaac stayed close, asking me questions. The more he talked, the more he seemed to be genuinely interested in my life and what I had to say. His mixed signals were starting to make my head spin. Last night he was ridiculing me with Will, but now he was acting totally nice? As I stepped onto the final platform, I looked over the forest canopy, taking in the beauty of Tennessee. A bird of prey soared across a bright blue sky, scattered with white, puffy clouds, and dove into the blanket of green leaves beneath. Beyond the woods, the lake sparkled in the afternoon sun. Tree-covered mountains rose up in the distance. He joined me on the platform, a smelling woodsy with a hint of sweat, a heady combination that set my pulse racing. Wow, this is breathtaking, Isaac said. I stole a glance at him. His eyes took in the scene before us like a thirsty man seeing an oasis in the desert. Yeah, I breathed. He looked down at me, his brown eyes crinkling at the corners. Between Isaac's enticing smell and the way his eyes pulled me in, I was very much in danger of getting my heart broken. I looked away. Bad destiny. Don't fall into his trap. It was one thing to watch him from afar, but a very different thing to be standing alone with him, sharing a moment in nature. I climbed down the ladder, planting my feet on hard-packed dirt. I'm going to give you my honest opinion, he said once he'd joined me on the ground. I think you should audition. What do you have to lose? Sure, it's scary, but you just mastered the high ropes. He gestured to the course above. Primus auditions are nowhere near as bad as what you just did. Maybe not for you. And maybe not for you either. You'll never know if you don't give it a shot. I locked eyes with him, and this time I didn't turn away. You're right, I said. His face broke out into a brilliant smile, revealing perfectly straight teeth. So does this mean you're trying out? I nodded. It still scares the heck out of me, but yeah. Awesome. Isaac said. He glanced back at the ropes and shuddered. Seriously though, I'm glad to be down here for a change, he said with a chuckle. Like you were scared at all, I scoffed and then immediately blushed, 
catching myself being more open with Isaac than I'd intended. He grinned like he'd won a trophy. I was a lot more scared than you'd realize, he said. Chapter 6, Destiny Megan Nelson, my best friend from church, sprawled across my purple bedspread on her belly, her light brown hair spilling around her shoulders, soaking up every word of what had happened to me on the retreat. The Nelson and Clark families were super tight-knit and had been since we'd converted. We practically lived out of each other's houses. The room I shared with my 13-year-old sister, Olivia, was painted a soft gray. We had twin beds with dark wood headboards and a matching desk pushed up to the window. So many times last year, when I sat at the desk doing homework, I found myself gazing out into the trees instead, daydreaming that Isaac would appear to take me away from my algebra. I'd like to say my room was my escape from the world like a normal girl my age, but it really wasn't. How could it be much of a sanctuary when Olivia was always blasting her flute in my ears? She'd been obsessed with getting first chair in the band all summer long. I can't believe after all these years of crushing on Isaac, he's finally starting to come around, Megan said. Not exactly, I replied. He just seemed really interested in my life once he found out I liked him. Yeah, because he likes you back. I shook my head. But he seemed so grossed out by the idea when Will first told him about it. That was just peer pressure. He didn't want his friend to know how he really felt. I peered back at her. Do you think so? Of course. Guys are always trying to act cool in front of their friends. That can't be right. He has a girlfriend. I filled her in on how I'd seen them together by the waterslide. Do you think he found out that you'd overheard his conversation with Will? Maybe he felt bad and wanted to make it up to you. I hadn't thought of that. I liked that explanation, best of all. I hopped off my bed and crossed the room to my closet. What should I wear to my first day of school? I pushed aside my small collection of trendy shirts and jeans and pulled forward the school uniforms. I have such a fabulous selection, I joked. For the tops I can choose red polos, navy polos, or white button-downs. For the bottoms, I have the lovely option of navy pants, khaki pants, or this amazing red and navy plaid skirt that comes to my knees. I whipped out the hanger with the skirt and held it against my hips. Megan giggled. If I really want to mix things up, I could add in a navy cardigan. I grabbed the hanger with the cardigan and draped it over my torso. And if I want to be super trendy, I can add this belt over it to finish the look. I held the top hanger with my chin and brandished out a braided brown belt that I liked to knot over my cardigans. Hmm, Megan said, coming closer. It's too hot for sweaters, so I recommend the white button-down and the skirt. I set the winning combination aside and laid out the new ballet flats Grandmama bought me last week. Dad's old law firm had to close its doors last year because of the economy, and since then, money had been tight. He found a job after looking for six months, but it was with a smaller law firm with much lower pay. Mom and Dad almost pulled us out of Bethel to save money. I'd already mentally prepared myself for the scary switch to public school in the middle of my freshman year, but Grandad heard about it and stepped forward with the money to keep us at Bethel. He was convinced that if we stayed at Bethel, we'd eventually come to our senses and return to the flock. Regardless of our differences in faith, we were so grateful to him and his sacrifice. He probably saw the money he spent on our education as a type of mission opportunity, like it was his calling from God to save us. Before Dad's job crisis, we'd had a pretty good. We went to private school, but Mom and Dad never believed in spending truckloads of money to indulge us. They'd made sure we had decent clothes to wear, a large comfortable home, and plenty of food to put on the table, but they'd tried to avoid extravagances. Since Dad lost his job, our clothes had gotten a bit worn, but thanks to Grandmama and Grandad's generosity, we each had a new pair of shoes to wear to school. The garlicky smell of Mom's homemade spaghetti sauce floated through my open bedroom door. My stomach grumbled. Wow. Do you smell that? Megan sniffed, and she sighed in ecstasy. That smells like heaven. Come on, let's go check it out. We left my room and wandered down the long hallway lined with kids' bedrooms. There were four bedrooms, but five kids. 
It was a major problem, if you asked me. Since Michael was the oldest, he got senior privilege and didn't have to share with Elijah, who was eleven. That left the sharing to me and Olivia. It was completely unfair that Olivia and Brianna couldn't share a room, but Mom insisted it was because they were so much further apart in age. Brianna was only eight and had toys scattered everywhere. Yeah, right. The toys wouldn't have bugged Olivia. She still secretly played with Barbies. Mom and Dad listened to whatever Olivia wanted because she was the golden child and had wanted to share with me. It gave her more opportunities to stick her nose in my business. Dad sat on the family room sofa, talking on the phone, still in his suit from going to church earlier. He frowned and ran a hand through his graying hair, thick with the waves I'd gotten from him. From the bit of conversation I overheard, he was talking to someone from church needing help. As a bishop, he spent a lot of his time serving others. Mom stirred her homemade spaghetti sauce, wearing the black apron with white polka dots and pink frills I'd made her for Mother's Day last year. The buttons on the front were lopsided, but she still wore it every time she cooked. She looked up at us and her face broke out into a big smile. Hey there, beautiful girls. Olivia leaned against the black granite counter, chopping romaine with her best friend Brinley Nelson, Megan's little sister. Brinley was a cute blonde girl with a cheery smile and a ready laugh. Olivia's long hair, still styled from church, hung in loose dark waves around her face. She looked like she could be in an herbal essence commercial. When I was 13, I didn't have a clue what to do with it. Most people talk about their bad hair day. I had a bad hair year. I hid all the school pictures from that year in the bottom of my mom's cedar chest with the hope that they'd be forgotten there. Michael walked into the kitchen with his best friend Preston, the oldest of the Nelson kids, who still wore his suit from church. Mom craned her neck around, and a huge grin broke out on her face. Ah, Preston's here. How are you? Tired. He ran a hand through wavy blonde hair. I just got out of a long youth committee meeting. Want to stay for dinner? Brinley and Megan are already here, so you might as well, Mom offered. Preston grinned. You know I could never turn down your cooking. I'd never seen Preston turn down anyone's cooking. The guy was always eating. Michael picked a cherry tomato out of the salad and popped it into his mouth before Olivia could swat his hand away. That's disgusting. You probably haven't even washed your hands, she grouched. MMM. Are those homegrown? Preston asked. Mum, Michael said. They're so fresh. Your dad outdid himself this year with the garden, Preston said. You're telling me. I pulled weeds until my hands bled, I said. All summer, Dad woke me up early to pull weeds. After working in the garden, I fed the chickens and gathered eggs. It was a lot of work, but I loved being outside. Dad dug his hand into the basket of rolls, covered with a red linen napkin. He pulled out a roll and took a huge bite. Mom whirled around and plucked it out of his hand. Ben. No rolls. What about your diet? He reached to take the roll back, but she swung it away. Give it back. I've had a long day, and I'm starving. Then go find Elijah and Brianna for the prayer, and you can start with a nice big salad. Dad grunted, but did as she said, grabbing another roll as soon as she turned back to the spaghetti sauce. Preston's eyes sparkled as he watched the exchange, and a corner of his mouth tugged up as he met my eye. I glanced at Michael. Have you been telling people I'm thinking about trying out for Primus? Only the person who asked. My jaw fell open, and Megan and I exchanged a startled look. He asked? Preston leaned against the wall next to the pantry and pulled his smartphone from inside his suit jacket. Olivia stopped chopping lettuce. Who asked about Destiny trying out? I narrowed my eyes. Why did she have to stick her nose into my business? Isaac Robinson asked me at breakfast. It was kind of weird, actually. Did he talk to you about it or something? Michael said. Yep, I replied, leaving it at that. The less said about Isaac, the better. 
I thought you said Isaac always ignores you, Olivia pointed out with an accusatory edge to her voice. Preston glanced up from his phone. I glowered at her. I'd trusted Olivia with the knowledge of my crush for the past year, and she'd kept my secret safe. But that was back when he acted like I didn't exist. Now that he was actually talking to me, she thought it was okay to start an open discussion? Olivia, that wasn't very nice. You wouldn't want Destiny to talk about your crush in front of everyone, Mom said. I threw my hands into the air. I never said he was my crush. How did Mom even know I liked Isaac? Was she just making an assumption, or had Olivia ratted me out? Michael arched an eyebrow, and Megan kept her head down with her lip pressed together, but the merriment in her eyes was unmistakable. Don't give me that look, Michael. It's not like that, I insisted. Isaac's not even a Mormon. Michael coughed. I ignored the smile he'd failed to hide. I glanced at Preston, but he was still wrapped up in his phone. That's right, Dad said as he came into the room with Elijah and Brianna in tow. Destiny knows to only date good Mormon boys. Only just over a month until her big sweet 16, Olivia said. And then she can date. Brinley sighed like she was imagining me caught up in a fairy tale. My eyes flicked back to Preston. He looked up from his phone and met my eye. The awkwardness in this conversation had just skyrocketed. I looked away from Preston, my cheeks burning. Yes dad, I know. Believe me. You have nothing to worry about. I meant it, too. Sure, I had a crush on Isaac, but it didn't mean I had plans to actually act on those feelings. I'd promised myself long ago I would only date Mormon boys, and it wasn't a promise I intended to break. Chapter 7, Isaac Yo, Robinson. Come sit with us, bro. Trevor Wilkins, the quarterback, called from across the room. I walked into the cafeteria hand in hand with Aspen. I smiled broadly and lifted my free arm to wave back at Wilkins. So far, my first day of school as the student body president had been awesome. Are you sure you don't want to leave campus for lunch? Aspen asked. Nah, let's go sit with Trevor and Will. But the cafeteria food is so disgusting, and I'm really craving Sophie's. And we can actually leave now. Isn't that kind of antisocial? Anyway, you're always craving Sophie's, I said with a grin. I was starting to get tired of the little sandwich shop Aspen was obsessed with. I could only handle so much tuna fish and sliced deli meat. It's the best kept secret in town, she said with that gigantic smile of hers. It never failed to make my pulse race. With her platinum hair, upturned nose, and tiny waist, Aspen was the hottest girl at Bethel. And she was all mine. I looped my arm around her and drew her closer to me as I stepped into the lunch line. What are they serving, a familiar voice said through the crowd behind me. It was Hannah. I turned around and hid a groan when I saw she was with Destiny again. I edged closer to them to better hear what they were talking about. I never keep track, Destiny said as she held up a brown paper bag. My parents are too cheap to buy school lunches for all their kids. Save me a seat then, Hannah said, and she got into line. They were sitting together again? I clenched my jaw. I turned back to Aspen, just in time, to see her shove green playfully as he passed. Hey, are you sitting with us today? I asked him. Yeah, sure thing. You don't mind if I slip into line with you guys, do you? He asked, eyeing the growing line behind us. Nah, get in front of me. I waved him over and pulled Aspen in front of me. No one will say anything. Green stepped into the lunch line in front of Aspen. I glanced behind us. Destiny had disappeared into the crowd, but Hannah was in line about ten spots back glaring at Green. When we'd gotten our food, Aspen and Green headed to the condiment stand. I scanned the room and saw Trevor Wilkins sitting two tables away from where Destiny was sitting with the black girl, what was her name again? Charisse? No, Shanice. That was it. Wilkins waved me over enthusiastically and pointed at the empty seats across from him. 
I wandered over and took a seat. He was going on and on about the upcoming football season and how our new offensive line would make this year be so much better than last year. A couple minutes later, Aspen sat on the bench beside me. Hey there. I wrapped my arm around her shoulder. I slid down to make a spot for Green on the other side of me. She gave me a flirty smile. Hey, gorgeous. Green rolled his eyes. Two tables down I spotted Hannah and Destiny sitting with Shanice, Deshaun, and the new kid I'd seen with them at the retreat. Hannah and Destiny talked with their heads together like they were sharing some kind of girly secret. Destiny ran her fingers through her hair, which was straight today, and looked right at me. Her eyes widened, and her lips parted. Dang it. I was caught. Green elbowed me, and a corner of his mouth tugged upward. I shot him a look that said, not in front of Aspen. I wasn't ready to let her in on the plan. She definitely wouldn't like it. I looked down at my lasagna and reached to take my first bite. Except I'd forgotten to grab a fork. I stood up. Where are you going, babe? Aspen asked. Just to grab a fork. I'll be right back. I squeezed her hand. She stuck her lip out all pouty-like and continued holding my hand until I'd walked so far she was forced to let go. Destiny's table was only five feet away from the condiment stand, and I took the long way around so they wouldn't see me. They were still talking with their heads together when I got to the stand. I picked up a napkin and fork. It was Hannah's first day at a new school. I had a good excuse to say hi to her, right? As I debated this, Shanice's words caught my ear. I don't think so. It's like she's putting on some kind of show, like she wants everyone to see what a good person she is, Shanice said. I don't know about that, Destiny said. I turned back to the condiment stand and busied myself with wiping up a few drips. I agree with Shanice, Hannah said. She bugs me, too. I think Isaac would look much better sitting next to you, Destiny. Was Hannah for real? Forgetting stealth, I spun around to see Destiny's reaction. Destiny gave Hannah a mischievous look. I knew there was a reason I liked you, Hannah. So it was true. Destiny did like me. Y'all should come to my place after school today, so we can practice for our Primus auditions, Hannah said. A slow smile spread across my face. I had football practice after school today, but afterward, I could casually drop by, right? I had some paperwork to drop off to Aunt Bethany anyway. Maybe Destiny would still be there, and I'd have a chance to talk to her. It was the perfect excuse. What time? Shanice asked. I have to work until 5, but I'd need a ride over. 5.30? Hannah suggested. I got you, Deshaun said to Shanice. What about you, Hudson? You're trying out for Primus, right? Hannah verified, looking over at the new kid. Yeah. I can probably swing by, Hudson said. Destiny? Hannah asked. I'll have to check with my mom, Destiny said. You are trying out, right? Because you can't just use your mom as an excuse for skipping out on auditions. No, I decided I wanted to try out, Destiny reassured her and I couldn't help but smile. Regardless of Green's plan, I really did think she ought to audition. I'd heard her sing before at our school's Christmas program, and I was pretty sure she had what it took to be in Primus. Can you go call her right now? Hannah asked. Okay, I guess so. Destiny pushed up from the table and twisted, untangling her legs from the cafeteria bench. Dude. She's gonna to turn around and see me standing here. I tried to step out of her way, but I was too late. She crashed right into my chest. I bit my tongue to keep myself from swearing. Oh. Excuse me, she said and glanced up at me. She gasped and put a hand to her mouth. No, excuse me. I should have been watching where I was going. I grasped her upper arm to steady her. Her skin was like warm velvet. What would it be like to feel more of her skin? I jerked my hand away. 
Are you okay? Yeah. I'm fine, she rubbed her hand over the spot where I'd just touched her and smiled apologetically, her cheeks still pink from our encounter. Sorry, I have to go. She rushed past and disappeared into the crowd of people milling in and out of the lunchroom. Hannah glowered at me. You know, it's not very nice to listen in on other people's conversations. I was just getting a fork, so I thought I'd come over and see how your first day was going, I said lamely, holding up the fork as proof. It's going great. Now go away before you scare all my friends off, she said, shooing me away. You know him? Shanice asked as I walked away. He works for my parents. She wasn't bothering to mention that I was her cousin? Why would she hide something like that? I looked back to my table just in time to see Aspen pushing Will's arm. I frowned. She was giving him the same flirty smile she always used with me. I sat next to Aspen and joked like nothing was wrong, but it bugged me that she'd been flirting with Will. Did she flirt with other guys, too? Or just him? Later, as Aspen stood to throw her trash away, I caught her by the elbow. Can we talk? She nodded, and we made our way over to the nearby abandoned band room. What? She pouted. Annoyance flickered through me. The glint in her blue eyes told me she knew exactly what I wanted to talk about. Why were you hitting on Will? I asked bluntly. She glanced away and reached out for my hand. Are you jealous, babe? She asked. I pulled my hand away. Aspen, that's not cool. He's my best friend. Don't you think you should rein in the flirting a little bit? She dropped the pout and pursed her lips. Dang it. Why did she have to look so sexy when she was mad? So you did notice, she said, glancing back toward the cafeteria. I was beginning to think you were so caught up staring at that dirty Mormon girl you had forgotten all about me. She's not, what I was looking at, I caught myself, before I defended her to my girlfriend. Where had that come from? I bit back the words that would be sure to send Aspen into a fit. She looked up at me from under her long eyelashes and poked her bottom lip back out. You were totally ignoring me, she said softly, and a wave of guilt washed over me. I had been paying more attention to destiny than to her. I took her hand and kissed her on the forehead. I could never forget you, I reassured her, running my hands through her lush hair. I rested my chin on her head and pulled her into a hug. She wrapped her arms around my waist, and we stood like that for a minute. Still, I couldn't help but notice Destiny as she walked past, oblivious to Aspen standing with me in the shadows. I scooted my chair back in the library and tucked a stack of papers into my folder. I waved goodbye to Aspen and Will as they left. My first student body government meeting hadn't been too bad. I felt a little disorganized, but overall everything went well. As I zipped up my backpack, I caught Hannah's familiar voice babbling away on the other side of the bookshelf next to me. I stepped forward to talk to her but stopped mid-stride when I heard Destiny's voice. Aspen gets everything she wants. It's not fair. Not fair? Was it fair that Aspen had to move with her mom into her grandpa's tiny farmhouse while her dad stayed in the mansion with his new wife? Destiny had no idea what Aspen wanted and didn't get. I don't like her much either. She seems kinda fake, Shanice agreed. Anger burned in my chest. Who were they to say anything bad about her? They never even talked to her. And if they did, they might actually know what was going on in her life. So what if she acted fake sometimes? Aspen did her best to act happy. Why should she show her private pain to the world? I don't know why they picked her to be the chaplain, Shanice, continued. If you ask me, I say we should have picked Michael. We did pick Michael, Destiny grumbled. What do you mean? Shanice wondered. Didn't you know? He ran for chaplain at the end of last year and won the popular vote, but Dr. Robinson vetoed it. What? Why? Hannah said. Isn't it obvious? He said it's unacceptable for a Mormon to be a spiritual leader for the student body, Destiny said in a voice meant to sound like dad's. 
How could I forget it? Dad had been shocked and furious. No offense, but that kind of makes sense, Hannah said. I know. I thought he was crazy to run, she admitted. It really surprised me to hear Destiny say that. Especially after what she'd just said about Aspen. I would have expected her to be more supportive of her brother's campaign. I always imagined Michael's attempt to be chaplain as part of some kind of Mormon master plan to convert the entire school. Why'd he do it? Hannah asked. Good question. This ought to be interesting. He told me he figured he wouldn't win. He just wanted to see if he could. Huh. Not really what I was expecting to hear. How weird. Then again, would she really tell Hannah and Shanice about some plan to convert them? Probably not. Chapter 8, Destiny Hannah and I sat on a cement bench and stared out into the parking lot after school. My eyes were drawn to the black pickup truck parked in the spot labeled Student Body President. I'd been watching that black truck since Isaac got it last year for his 17th birthday. Although I'd never admit it to Hannah, I knew the year, make, and model. It was a 1997 Ford F-150. I even had the license plate memorized. Hey, there's my mom. She pointed to a silver Audi. I opened the back door. The kid in the back seat had longish dark hair and giant brown eyes fringed with the same long lashes Hannah had. He had on an orange Tennessee ball shirt. No uniform. Huh. Guess that meant he didn't go to Bethel. Hey, guys. I smiled shyly and gave a little wave. This is Lucas. Hey, hey. He smiled, pushed chestnut-colored bangs out of his eyes, and said. Your destiny, right? Hannah told me all about you. My back went rigid. What had she said? Lucas's smile was open and friendly, and it reminded me of Hannah's when she was being devious. Some of my tension fell away, and I smiled. Why does that not surprise me? Hannah's mom had short brown hair and laugh lines around her mouth. She turned, her eyes smiling, and said with a wave of her hand, Hannah doesn't like to talk a lot or anything. Oh no. I only speak when spoken to, Hannah joked. Hopefully she only said the best things, right? Nope, I told them what a weirdo you are. Hannah grinned. Like the fact that I was from the strange Mormon family? I shook off the negative thought. Hannah wasn't like that. Don't worry. Being a weirdo is a good thing, Hannah assured me. It's true, Lucas piped up. That's why we wanted to meet you. Huh. That wasn't the standard reaction I got when people learned I was a Mormon. Usually, they got a blank look on their faces and cut the conversation short so they could get away from me. These guys were refreshing. I grinned deviously. So you wanted to see the Destiny Freak show? We just figured you'd fit in with us crazies, Hannah's mom said. Exactly. He flashed a toothy smile. What a cute kid. One day, he was going to be a total lady killer. We left school and drove away from the busy part of town. We eventually ended up driving down a country road not too far from where my family lived. Mrs. Miller turned into a subdivision with beautiful large homes. A fountain sprayed cheerily in a pond next to an elegant sign that read Oakshire. The car followed a winding road, and after a few turns, we pulled into the driveway of a two-story brick home. It had a pristine, white wraparound porch lined with white rocking chairs. Let's get some food, and then I'll show you around. Hannah opened the door from the garage to a mudroom. She hung up her backpack and kicked off her shoes, and I did the same. She led me into a gigantic, country-style kitchen and opened the pantry door just to our left and disappeared inside. Seconds later, she re-emerged with two boxes of Pop-Tarts. Chocolate or strawberry? Chocolate. Is that even a question? She ripped open the foil of a package of chocolate Pop-Tarts and slid them into a toaster oven. I'm pretty much obsessed with Pop-Tarts. Mom doesn't go to the store without bringing me home more. 
After we finished off our snack, I said, we should go see if Evan's home, yet. Okay, but we need to ditch the uniforms first. Come upstairs, and I'll find you something to wear. You look like you're about my size. I followed her from the kitchen toward the front of the house. We passed an enormous living room with dark brown leather couches surrounding a huge flat-screen TV that must have cost a small fortune. We reached the foyer and ascended a curving staircase. The upper bedroom doors all faced down into the grand entry of the home. A glittering chandelier dangled down into the foyer. Your house sure is quieter than mine. Sometimes it gets boring. Boredom isn't allowed in my household. As soon as one of us mentions being bored, my mom puts us straight to work. We walked past Lucas' open door. He was sitting inside on a beanbag, playing a military shooting game on a gigantic flat screen. That must be nice. None of the kids in my family were allowed to have TVs in our room, let alone big, expensive ones. Hannah opened a door. Here's my room. The walls were a soft blue. White gauzy curtains hung over the windows. Prints of famous artwork hung on the wall. There was a queen-sized bed with a gold and cream bedspread that nicely offset the dark wood headboard. White fluffy clouds were stenciled onto the ceiling. Directly across from her bed was a fireplace with a TV identical to her little brother's hanging over it. Cool room. I like the clouds. The clouds are awesome, but the best part of my room is, she walked over to the window and pulled up the blinds. It looks right over into Evan's room. The window provided a clear view into an upstairs window of the house directly next door. The navy blue curtains were shut, but it was still fun to imagine he was right in there. Where are the binoculars? I teased. I started lifting pillows and stacks of laundry. I bet you've got them hidden around here somewhere. Very funny. I would never watch him like that. Hannah sprawled across the bed. Guess what? What? Evan asked me to go see a movie with him this Friday. No way. Way, Hannah said with a grin. Do your parents know about it? Yeah. They've been friends with his parents for years, so they were excited about it. I'm waiting to date until I'm 16. Why wait? It's something I learned at church. They talk about when to date. Yeah, we have a little book about it the youth use as a guide for their standards. Huh. What's it say? It covers stuff like modesty, music, books, drugs and alcohol, and of course, dating. I ticked the list off my fingers. Sounds interesting. Hannah pulled out a drawer on her bedside table and took out a pack of gum. How's it different from what they teach at Bethel? She unwrapped a piece and folded it into her mouth. Most of it's pretty close to what Southern Baptists believe. The main differences are the dating rules, not drinking black tea or coffee, and we don't wear short shorts or sleeveless stuff. If you want to see for yourself, you can come to my youth meeting on Wednesday night sometime. We love visitors. That sounds kind of fun. Hannah snapped her gum. She passed me the pack, and I slid a stick out of the little box. It really is. Preston and Megan are always there, too. I chewed the gum. The sharp taste of wintergreen cooled my mouth. Well, dang, if Preston's going to show up, I'll be sure to come sometime. I laughed. Okay, it's a deal then. There was a flash of movement outside. Evan strode across the strip of lawn between the two houses. He'd changed into khaki shorts and a baby blue striped polo shirt. It's him, Hannah hissed. Should we go to go talk to him? Right now, she squeaked. Yeah, why not? Maybe I should knock on the window to get his attention, I joked. No, no. I'll go out there. She raced to her closet and began furiously digging through piles of clothes heaped in the bottom of her large walk-in closet. I pulled the blinds back down. Here. She tossed me a bundle of navy cotton printed with tiny yellow flowers. I held it up and the lightweight fabric billowed to the floor. It was a maxi dress with spaghetti straps. This is a cute dress, 
but do you have a shirt I could put under it? Oh yeah, that would go back to the modesty thing. She pulled out a shirt from one of her dresser drawers and tossed it to me. She put on a black tank top and a denim miniskirt with sparkly silver earrings that reached a couple of inches past her earlobes. Once we were dressed, I pulled the blinds back up again. He's still out there. Hannah blew out the puff of air she must have been holding. He's playing with his dog in the backyard. He doesn't look like he's going anywhere. We left Hannah's bedroom and took the staircase at the back of the house that led down to the kitchen and mudroom. These stairs remind me of a hidden servant's staircase. Hannah grinned devilishly. I can definitely appreciate the, um, privacy they can provide. Translation, they're good for sneaking out. As soon as we opened the back door, we were hit with a thick wall of hot air. I blinked in the blinding August sunlight. The large grassy yard was surrounded by a white vinyl fence. The back right corner was home to a trampoline. A yellow lab came bounding toward us. She saw me and sniffed all around my legs. Hannah bent down, rubbing the dog behind the ears. This is Buttercup. She's the best doggy in the whole wide world. She's a good girl, yes, she said in a voice reserved for talking to dogs and cute little kids. I glanced over toward Evan's house. I could hear him calling out to his dog. How are we going to get his attention? Hannah whispered to me. Just go talk to him. It's scary, she whispered back. I thought you were the one with all the confidence. She fiddled with a ring on her finger and gave me an embarrassed smile. Climb up on the trampoline and act happy to see him. Who would have thought that I'd be the one convincing her to be bold with a guy? She took a deep breath. Okay, I can do this. We shimmied ourselves onto the trampoline. The smooth black fabric was hot on my bare feet. We walked to the fence and hooked our arms over the side. Evan was on the other side of his yard petting his dog. Act cool, I whispered. Hey, Evan, she called cheerfully. He looked up from petting his dog and lifted a hand in acknowledgement. He strutted across the yard, his smile widening. Hey there, what's up? His voice was deep with the slight accent of a southern gentleman. Not too much. We're recovering from our first day of school. How do you like Bethel Baptist? So far, it's great. Everyone's nice. Well, I'm glad you feel welcome. He flashed a gorgeous smile, and Hannah looked like she was about to start fanning herself. So, what brings you to our neck of the woods, Destiny? I opened my mouth to reply, but Hannah cut in with, we're trying out for Primus, and she came over to practice with me. Evan's eyes lit in understanding. Ah, well good luck to you. I hope you two get in. He hesitated and then said, do y'all want to come over and have something cold to drink? We'd love to. Hannah smiled sweetly. We climbed down from the trampoline and met Evan where he was waiting for us at the gate. Let's take the front door so you ladies don't have to be mauled by my dog. He led the way to the front of his house. He opened the front door and revealed a beautiful foyer. Similar to Hannah's, his home also had a grand entrance, only his had two curving staircases that met at a platform in the middle. In the style of Gone with the Wind, a large chandelier hung down like the crowning jewel of the room. I could almost picture Scarlett O'Hara running down one of those staircases. He led us straight down a hallway to the back of the house and into a spacious white kitchen. Evan opened the fridge and took out a glass pitcher of amber liquid. Is iced tea okay? It's fine for me, but Destiny doesn't drink tea. Evan glanced at me quizzically. It's a Mormon thing. How about some water then? That would be great. Evan gave me a dimpled smile and handed me a glass filled with water and ice from the fridge. I headed to the chair he pulled out for me at the table. I forgot you were a Mormon, Evan said. I grinned. Yep. I wouldn't say I'm any one religion beyond being a Christian. I believe in God, and I follow what the Bible says, Evan said. That's exactly how I feel, Hannah agreed. I nodded. It was something I had heard said a lot around school lately. 
I wasn't exactly sure why, but I assumed it was because a lot of people were tired of the strict Baptist rules and were looking for something less restrictive, less judgmental. Hannah looked up at Evan and met his eye. She smiled, but didn't look away. Evan beamed at her like she was the most beautiful girl he'd ever seen. The chemistry zapped between them like an electric current. I averted my eyes and sipped my water for something to do. You play guitar, don't you? Hannah asked. How would you know that? I usually play guitar alone in my room, he said with a grin. Have you been watching me? Hannah's hand flew to her mouth. What? Oh my gosh, no. Don't worry. I'm just messing with you. Evan smiled. There's something I haven't told you, Hannah. What? she asked expectantly. I'm trying out for Primus, too. You are? Why didn't you say anything before? He shrugged. You should come over and practice with us, Hannah suggested. We're expecting a bunch of other people to show up in about an hour, but we could head over now and get a head start. All right, he said. Let's go. We put our glasses in the sink and moved our socializing over to the Miller's house. When Evan walked into the foyer with us, Mrs. Miller's heels clicked against the marble floor as she came in from the office located across the entryway. Evan, it's so good to see you. How've you been? I'm fine, Mrs. Miller, thank you for asking. Can I get you a drink or anything? No, ma'am, but thanks for the offer. We just had one at my place. Mom, Evan's trying out for Primus, too, so I invited him join our practice group tonight. How fabulous. Well, don't mind me. I'll be in the office getting some work done. Let me know if you need anything. She retreated behind a set of French doors to the left of the foyer. To our right was a room elegantly decorated with armchairs placed strategically around a glossy black grand piano. Hannah scooted onto the piano bench, tugging her miniskirt down. But it didn't help any. We're not supposed to come prepared with a specific piece of music memorized, are we? Evan asked. No, from what I've heard, Mr. Bird doesn't require it, Hannah said. To keep my hand from shaking, I smoothed the lightweight cotton of the sundress I wore. Singing in front of Hannah was one thing, but now that Evan was here. I took a few deep breaths. I needed to stop being so tense, or my voice would crack. Okay, let's do some warm-ups. Hannah played arpeggios. Her long, slender fingers moved comfortably over the keys. I took a deep breath and let my voice take over. Hannah and Evan's voices joined with mine. Nice job, guys. Destiny, you sound like a pretty strong alto to me. Evan, I'm going to say you're a tenor. Am I right? Yep. That's kind of how I am. I can switch between soprano and alto if I need to, said Hannah. Let's start with Amazing Grace. I'll take the melody. Can you guys find your own parts? I nodded. Good, she said. Our voices blended with a seamless harmony. As we sang the words, I thought about how it connected with my testimony of Christ, and it gave me chills. Oh my gosh, y'all. We sound awesome. You sound like you've been singing for a long time, I said. I'm guessing you didn't learn that from Acorn Creek's music department. Megan was always complaining about how the choir sucked at Acorn Creek. No way. I joined a private choir, I have some musical theater experience, and I've taken voice lessons for as long as I can remember. My dad's actually in the Christian music industry. Whoa, really? I said. Yeah, anyway. I hope I get into Primus so I won't have to drive across town to sing with my private choir anymore. I hope so, too. What about you, Evan? I asked. You seem to know what you're doing as well. What kind of musical experience have you had? Nothing really, other than singing with the choral singers and playing around making YouTube videos with my guitar. Well, you're doing something right. It seems to me you have an excellent chance at getting in, especially since you're a junior, I said. Want to sing another song? 
Hannah asked. Evan, I could totally listen to you sing all day. There's something so appealing about a guy who can sing. Wow, she was getting bold. Where did the shy Hannah of the trampoline go? Chapter 9, Isaac Hannah's front door loomed before me. I knocked three times and waited. Releasing a pent-up breath, I tapped the stack of paperwork that Aunt Bethany had requested against my leg. After coming home from football, I'd changed into a blue dress shirt and spritzed on the cologne aspen went crazy over. I should have come up with a better plan to pull Destiny in, but other than dressing up, my mind kept coming up empty. Why did I think winging it was such a good idea earlier? The door opened. Speak of the devil. Destiny's eyes widened. Isaac? She had changed out of her uniform skirt and now wore one of Hannah's favorite sundresses that typically showed a lot of cleavage. But Destiny kept a white shirt beneath it with sleeves and a higher neckline. Hey! I looked past her shoulder. Hannah sat at the piano with her next-door neighbor Evan. Hudson, Shanice, and Deshaun crowded around the piano. What are you doing here? Destiny asked. Wow. A corner of my mouth lifted. Thanks for the warm welcome. Destiny flushed. I, uh, I didn't mean it like that, she stammered. I just meant. Isaac? Aunt Bethany appeared behind her. Oh good, come on in. Destiny opened the door wider. I took off my aviators, tucked them into my shirt pocket as I stepped inside. Destiny's gaze lingered on my bare forearms, beneath the rolled-up sleeves of my shirt. She averted her gaze like she'd just been caught doing something naughty. I smirked. Nice. Were you able to get those papers signed for me? Aunt Bethany asked. Yes, ma'am. I have them right here. I handed her paperwork. You're such a lifesaver. I honestly don't know what I'd do without you. I can think of a way you can make it up to me, I said with a wide smile. Landing me a recording contract would be a good start. I'm doing everything I can, but these things take time. I hate waiting, I sighed. Destiny stood behind the heavy mahogany door with her eyebrows drawn together. Patience never was your strongest quality. Aunt Bethany smiled. She glanced over her shoulder. I'm guessing you know these guys from school? I glanced at the group in the piano room. Yes, ma'am. I do. You know, I bet they could use your help. They're getting ready for their Primus auditions. Think you could give them some pointers since you're the seasoned pro? I don't know how much of a pro I am, but I can see what I can do to help. I looked at Destiny and flashed a smile. Her lips parted, and she looked away. I walked over to the piano and Hannah began to stand. I put up a hand to stop her. No, you keep playing. Go ahead with what you were doing before, and I'll observe for a minute. Hannah played the introduction to a John Rutter piece I knew well and the group blended together with rich harmony. Sounds good, guys, I said. The main thing Mr. Bird is looking for in the audition is your ability to hear pitch. If you can hear well, then he has something to work with. From there, any vocal training you may have is a plus. Although, if you can prove you have a good ear, but your tone is off, your voice is cracking, and your pitch is all over the place, he probably still won't accept you. You're not instilling me with a ton of confidence, bro, Evan said. Destiny gave a shaky laugh. I shook my head. Y'all got this, I said. Honestly? Hannah searched my face. I nodded. Well, I haven't heard everyone individually, but from what I've heard, it's solid. Unless Mr. Bird gets a big group of supremely talented people trying out, you guys will be fine. Deshaun, we always need to fill the bass section, so I'm not worried about you. Hudson and Evan, even though you both sound like natural tenors, I recommend you guys try out as baritones. Mr. Bird just had the majority of the baritone section wiped out when last year's seniors graduated. The same goes for Destiny and Shanice. The soprano section has two openings, three max, 
but we had several of our top altos graduate, so I know for a fact he'll be looking for some strong altos. What about Hannah? Destiny asked. I paused and fixed my gaze on Hannah. Hannah already knows what I think. It's a for sure slam dunk even if she tries out as a soprano. Destiny gave a confused look to her friend, but Hannah only shrugged and turned away from her, hiding a crooked smile. What was Hannah up to now? We migrated to the leather sectional in the center of the big room. Shanice and Deshaun cozied up on one end of the large couch and Hannah and Evan sat on the opposite end. I spread out in the middle of the couch. Hudson sat in a nearby armchair. Hannah waved Destiny over toward us. Destiny's brow rose as she looked at Hannah, but she hung back. Was Destiny afraid of me? Isaac. You have to see this, Hannah said. Evan loves bad lip reading videos, too. Destiny crossed the room with her eyes lowered. Have you seen this one? Evan asked. I glanced at the screen. Oh, yeah. I've seen that one. Hannah rolled her eyes. I think Isaac's seen every one ever made. She nudged me. Scoot over. I want Destiny to see this, too. I slid down the curve of the sectional but kept my arm extended along the back of the seat. Destiny hesitated, her eyes fixed on my arm. Our eyes met, and a rush of electricity ran down my spine. I looked away. She was so beautiful. She wasn't as polished as Aspen, but it was a good thing. She was more down-to-earth. I shook my head to clear my thoughts. Why was I comparing them? That certainly wasn't why I was here. She took a step closer. What are you guys even talking about? Are you serious? Hannah gasped like the world had ended. Do you never get on YouTube? Where have you been? As Destiny sat, her arm brushed mine. Her hair swung loosely around her shoulders as she laughed at Hannah, releasing the scent of wildflowers. What had Hannah asked her? I breathed in destiny, and my brain wiped out. What's wrong with me? My parents really aren't that big on technology, Destiny said. They have one desktop computer on the complete opposite end of the house from me, and I have this piece of junk for a phone. She held up a flip phone. It's been passed down from my dad to my mom to Michael and eventually to me. I've had it for the past two years, and I'm long overdue for an upgrade. It's a miracle the thing even turns on anymore. Hannah rolled her eyes. Destiny's parents are crazy strict. Welcome to the club. I snorted. I twisted toward Destiny and put on my nice guy face. I don't want to be too forward or anything, but I have a question for you. She looked up from lowered eyes. Um. Okay. I cleared my throat. Don't take this the wrong way, but I'm kind of curious. Is it like, a Mormon thing to be disconnected from technology? She laughed. It was a sweet, musical sound. No. That's just my family. My parents are really old-fashioned and uber-conservative. They're special that way. Hannah smacked me across the stomach. She's Mormon, not Amish. Hey, I said, flinching. Give me a break. I didn't know. It's okay. I don't mind talking about it, Destiny said. That's true. She told me all kinds of stuff, Hannah piped up. Green hadn't been exaggerating. Hannah really was enthusiastic about Mormon stuff. So, what do you believe, anyway? Evan asked. Hannah said you don't drink tea or coffee, but that's about all I know. I clenched my molars. So now Hannah was talking to Evan about Mormons, too. It could be worse than I thought. That's kind of a huge question, Destiny said. Um, I believe in God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. She was trying to sugarcoat it, but I saw right through it. But you don't believe in the Trinity, right? Like you think they're separated somehow, I said. Her brow rose in surprise. Uh, yes. That's right. 
When the Bible says they're one, we don't believe they're one person, just one in purpose. Interesting. I gave her an encouraging smile. Can you tell us more? Okay, um, she curled and uncurled her fists in her lap. We believe the Bible and the Book of Mormon are God's word. We use them side by side. So when I go to church, I carry both. Huh, Evan said. What's the Book of Mormon about? Well, she exhaled. We'd be here the whole night if I told you about all of it, so I'll give you the short version. I studied the pattern of the tiny yellow flowers on Destiny's dress as she explained. Basically, it's the story of what happened during biblical times, but in the Americas. It's not exactly the same time periods, but a bunch of it overlaps. And you believe that after Jesus died, he came to visit the people in the Book of Mormon, I stated. Hannah needed to know just how weird these guys really were. Yeah. It's my favorite part actually, she said, her voice quiet. I'm impressed you knew that, Isaac, Hannah said, rubbing her bare arms from the chill of the air conditioning. I thought I was the know-it-all, but I hadn't heard about that. I shrugged. I guess I know some of the main doctrinal stuff, but I don't know much about the lifestyle. I actually had no clue about the coffee and tea thing. I don't think I could live without coffee. Destiny smiled. I've never had coffee, so I don't really know what I'm missing. You've never tried it? Evan asked with a disbelieving arch to his brow. Nope. Not even before you were a Mormon? I asked. She shook her head. I was only eight. My parents drank it all the time back when we were Baptist. It was really tough for mom to give it up, but I never drank it. I was a picky eater as a kid, so at the time, coffee sounded disgusting. They wouldn't have let me drink it anyway. The last thing they wanted was a caffeinated eight-year-old. I remember it, I said quietly. All of a sudden, I was in fifth grade again, and I'd just realized Michael wasn't coming back and we couldn't be friends anymore. Huh? she asked. I remember when you guys left. I mean, when you became Mormons. Oh. The room grew silent. No one really seemed to know what to say. Destiny's head was bent as she picked at the ends of a handful of her hair. Suddenly, the room was overwarm. This wasn't working. All it was doing was digging up the past, and it was too painful. I leaped to my feet. Destiny's eyes burned holes in my back, but I didn't turn to meet her gaze. Well, I'd better get home. I have to plan the agenda for my next student government meeting. Good luck to you guys with your Primus auditions. I gave a rigid smile and turned to cross the room. Just before I reached for the doorknob, I turned and lifted a hand in farewell. I'll see you guys tomorrow. They said their goodbyes, and as the door shut, my stomach sunk. Chapter 10, Destiny I stared after Isaac as he left through Hannah's front door. That dude's weird, Hudson said. He acts like destiny is some kind of joke for liking him, but then he comes over here and plays 20 questions about what she believes. It's not cool to toy with someone's heart like that. Was that what Isaac was doing? I didn't think so. He seemed genuinely interested in the religion. Not so much in me. Hannah frowned. Just because he was curious about Mormons doesn't mean he's toying with her heart. Isaac doesn't think she's a joke. I asked him about her. He said he thinks Destiny is a nice girl, Will had just caught him off guard. He felt really bad about it. Some of the ache in my heart slid away. Maybe he really did feel bad. First the ropes course, and then Isaac shows up at Hannah's and acts all chatty. The ropes were a coincidence, but he probably showed up to Hannah's house to see her. And she sure seemed happy to see him. She'd said that she was crushing on Evan, but she seemed flirtier with Isaac than with Evan. I finally built up the courage to bring it up with her on the way to our audition the next day. Is something going on between you and Isaac? No. What do you mean? Hannah asked, not missing a beat. How does he seem to know you so well? I told you. He works for my parents. 
sometimes he helps me with my voice. We turned the corner and the line of chairs outside the choir room came into view. All thoughts of Isaac and Hannah flew from my mind. My stomach dropped. Would I ever be ready for this audition? Hannah and I sat in the metal chairs. I gripped the cold metal of the seat and crossed my ankles. Breathe. Just breathe, destiny. The doors at the end of the hall opened, and cheerleaders poured from the gym. Jesse and Maddie Weston walked by in their red and white cheerleading uniforms. Both girls had their hair pulled up into high ponytails with red ribbons. After Jesse joined the cheerleading squad, Maddie promptly replaced me as her best friend. I wasn't allowed to try out as a cheerleader, and once Jesse joined the crowd, it felt like we had been moved to separate planets. Twenty feet down the hall, they stopped at their lockers. Maddie brought her dark head close to Jesse's. It was a running joke at the school that the hall that near the musical hall was called Prep Hall because all the preppy girls had their lockers there. I lowered my gaze to the chemistry book on my lap but kept my ears tuned into their conversation. Is she trying out for Primus? Maddie asked. I don't know why she's bothering, I only caught snatches of what Jessie said, but her tone was so snotty, I didn't want to hear the rest. Mr. Bird has really high standards. She glanced over and caught me watching them. She grabbed Sophie's arm and turned her so their backs were to me. Although she'd lowered her voice, I still caught the words Christmas program. My cheeks flamed. I'd sung in a trio at the Choral Singers Christmas program last year. I'd been so proud of how well I'd done, but by the sound of Jessie's mocking tone, I'd say she hadn't thought it was too impressive. Have you auditioned, yet? Maddie asked Jessie. Yeah, earlier today. How'd you do? She shrugged. I'm not worried about it. Jessie shut her locker and the two girls disappeared around the corner. Not worried about it? How'd she have so much confidence? Hannah looked over at me, rolling her eyes. You know she's totally lying, right? I didn't know it. I didn't know anything other than the sick feeling in my stomach. I winced as the soprano in the choir room hit a sour note. That could be me in a minute. I scrunched my face in irritation. If I didn't calm down, my voice would be too tight and I'd end up ruining the entire audition. The door opened, and a skinny girl with dark blonde hair walked out. Mr. Bird followed with a clipboard. Destiny Clark? He peered at me over his reading glasses. Are you ready? I followed him into the choir room, taking several deep breaths to calm myself. He sat down at the piano and opened a hymnal to Silent Night. I'd like you to sing the alto line for me here. I nodded with relief. I'd already memorized the same version of Silent Night from singing with the church choir. My voice carried the harmony smoothly. Next, he tested my sight reading ability by asking me to sing the alto part from a song I was completely unfamiliar with. I wasn't sure if I hit all the notes, but it didn't clash with his accompaniment, so it must have at least been close. At the end, he played a random combination of notes, stopped playing, and then had me repeat the notes. I had to concentrate, but I found I was able to follow the complicated patterns of notes, without a problem. You have a very good ear. I do. We'll use you. He gave a satisfied nod. Welcome to Primus. Unbelievable. Receiving an acceptance at the audition was rare. Michael was on edge the night after his audition, two years ago. Mr. Bird always posted a list of those who made it on the choir door the next day. Being in Primus wasn't just being in a choir that sang incredible music. You became accepted by people who viewed you as invisible before. According to Michael, many Bethel alumni who had been in Primus went on to attend prestigious music universities. Several of them were in the orchestra as well, and after college went on to play for big city orchestras. A few of them even went on to sing on Broadway. For the majority of the choir, music was their life. And now it was my future. When I walked out to the hall, Hannah and Shanice were talking. Shanice must have arrived during my audition. Hannah looked up at me and stopped mid-sentence. Her brow crept upward. 
the victory must have been written all over my face. Did you? I nodded with a huge grin. What? Shanice looked between us in confusion. Hannah's eyes slipped past me. I turned to follow her gaze. Mr. Bird stood in the doorway behind me. Hannah Miller? I took a seat by Shanice, but she quickly hopped up when she spotted Deshaun and Hudson approaching us. She sauntered over to Deshaun with a coy smile. Hannah's strong voice rang through the door. She sounded much better than I had. It was no wonder. She'd had more training since she'd already been in musicals before with her private choir. I had complete faith in her ability to ace the audition. Isaac and his younger brother Joshua came around the corner. Joshua slumped into a folding chair a few seats down from me, his light brown hair tousled. Isaac reached out to fist bump him. You got this, bro. Whatever. Joshua didn't even bother looking up to him. Isaac lowered his fist lamely, a side of his mouth quirking up when his eyes landed on me. Hey, Destiny. Waiting to audition? I shook my head. I just went. I'm waiting for Hannah to finish. Isaac glanced over at the door, recognition passing over his face as Hannah's clear notes floated into the hallway. He sidled up next to me, settling in the chair where Hannah had been just moments before. Hey there, he said, giving me a dazzling smile. How'd your audition go? I stared into his beautiful eyes, debating whether to tell him that I already knew I'd gotten in. Suddenly, I felt embarrassed about telling Isaac, especially in front of his brother. Um. I bit my bottom lip. It was good. Just good? Isaac pressed. What about the pitch testing? How'd you do on that? He sat close, his face eager. The intoxicating spice of his cologne enveloped me. My eyes lingered on his soft lips. They looked incredibly kissable. I imagined him leaning forward to kiss me, and wondered what he'd taste like. My face grew hot. I forced myself to concentrate on what he was asking, but my brain was mush. I locked my gaze with his, my breathing speeding up, and his eyes softened. Isaac, a shrill voice interrupted my stupor. What are you doing? His head snapped around. Oh, uh, Aspen. Hey. I'd never seen Isaac so flustered. She stood in her cheerleading uniform with her arms crossed over her chest and a furious look on her face. The choir room door opened, and Hannah came out. I breathed a sigh of relief, not sure why I'd sensed any tension in the first place. Why would Aspen be angry at Isaac? Was it because he was talking to me? Why should that bother her? So? What happened? I asked, wondering if he decided to start accepting everyone on the spot now, or if it was just me. He said to check the list tomorrow. I hate this suspense. I can't believe you got in. You're so lucky, she moaned. What do you mean? Aspen demanded. How does Destiny know she already got in? Jessie and Sydney rounded the corner. Jessie's green eyes narrowed, her furious gaze directed straight at me. What? Why does she get to know already? Hannah shrugged. When you're that good, you're that good. I shook my head. She was crazy. I couldn't explain why Mr. Bird had let me in on the spot, but it certainly couldn't be because of any extraordinary talent on my part. Hannah grabbed onto Shanice and me. Come on. Let's go hit up the snack machine. I'm starving. She dragged us from the spot, leaving a hall full of people gaping after us. You and Isaac were looking a little bit cozy over there, Shanice said as we walked. What's she talking about? Hannah demanded. Spill it. I, uh, I have no idea. Lies, Hannah said. Shanice, tell what really happened. They were getting all googly-eyed, sitting all close, breathing hard. You know what I mean, Shanice reported. And ooh, girl. You should have seen Aspen. She was furious. She knows he secretly wants you. 
Speaking of getting cozy, Hannah said, what's the deal with you and Deshaun? Are you guys dating or not? Shanice smiled, coyly. We'll have to see about that. Hannah and Shanice kept talking, but my mind was miles away. My brow furrowed. Isaac secretly wanted me? Could that be true? The image of his eyes softening as he looked into mine flashed into my mind. The look on his face seemed so real. He looked at me like I was beautiful. Not just my face or my body, but my soul. When he looked at me like that, it felt like there was a magnet between us, pulling me toward him. It was undeniable and strong. I'd always crushed on him from afar, but the closer he got the stronger the magnetic pull became. Had he been noticing it, too? Was that why he'd been spending so much time talking to me? I ached to have him look at me like that again. I wanted to feel his arms around me, to know what it was like to kiss him. I'd always considered myself plain and quiet, not exactly the kind of girl guys fought over. I mean, sure, I'd had guys show interest before, but they weren't ever guys I'd wanted. But Isaac? How could the hottest guy at school actually feel something for me? Maybe I wasn't plain after all. Maybe, just maybe I was someone worth his attention. But what then? What if he actually had strong feelings for me? Would he act on them? And what about Aspen? Surely, he couldn't keep dating her if he felt that way about me. What would I do if he decided to drop Aspen and asked me out instead? He was a Baptist, I was a Mormon. I'd have to turn him down. But could I actually do it? I pushed the thought from my mind. I wasn't going to dwell on that. Right now, I wanted to savor the idea that a guy as amazing as Isaac could possibly want to be with me. Chapter 11, Isaac Being the student body president at Bethel came with the perks of a personal office and a reserved parking space. The parking spot was awesome on mornings when I was running late and the lot was otherwise packed, but I especially liked having my own office. It had become a bit of a hangout spot, especially for the other officers, but sometimes, when I felt like I needed a moment to myself, I'd go in there and shut the door so people would assume that it was empty and locked. As I watched Hannah leave with Destiny and Shanice, I started to feel like I needed one of those moments. I cringed, preparing for a verbal lashing, but Aspen's cheerleader friends grabbed her attention. But her wrath was still coming at some point. I had no doubt of it. I bent down to Josh, when you're ready to head home, come get me. I'll be in my office. Josh gave me a thumbs up without bothering to look at me as I headed down the corridor toward my office. I unlocked the door and released a penned up breath. I kicked shut it shut and sunk into my desk chair. The walls were covered with posters, some with Bible verses on them, others were school spirit. Over my desk hung an older Bethel Bears banner that had probably been there since I was in kindergarten. I swiveled around, trying desperately to clear my head, but it wasn't working. Destiny's face popped into my mind. Her sweet smell of wildflowers filled my senses as though she were actually in front of me. What had just happened with her? The way she looked at me outside the choir room set my blood on fire. I wanted to take her in my arms, bury my face in her hair, and breathe in her shampoo. I shook my head. What was I thinking? I had to focus on the plan. I was running out of ideas. I needed to take the time to sit and brainstorm new ways to gather information. But the harder I pursued my goal to dig up dirt on the Mormons, the harder I fell for destiny. Every time I got near her, my brain fogged up, and I couldn't remember anything about the plan. I needed help, or I was going to lose complete control. My phone rang. Green. What's up? I asked. Hey. Just checking in. How are things going with Destiny? He asked. You just caught me thinking about that, actually, I said. To be honest, I'm feeling a little bit stuck. Think you could help me brainstorm some ideas of how to find out more information? Why don't you just spend more time with her? Get to know her. You need to get her to trust you better. Spend more time with her? I couldn't deny that the idea appealed to me. 
I wanted to get to know Destiny, but that was the problem. I wanted to know her, and I wanted her to trust me, and the more I worked to build that trust, the less I began to care about Green's plan. What about Aspen? She just caught me talking to Destiny, and she's starting to get angry. I leaned forward in my desk chair. Maybe it's time to let her in on the plan. Get her on board. Maybe she can befriend Destiny as well. I choked back a laugh. I don't think Aspen would go for that. I remembered the look on her face when she'd caught us together. The last thing Aspen wanted was to be friends with Destiny. Do you want me to talk to Aspen about it? He offered. No. I can do it. I just hope she'll believe me. If she didn't kill me in my sleep first. Chapter 12, Destiny When we walked outside with our snacks, Mom was parked in the suburban waiting for me. By Destiny. Hannah said. Congrats again on getting in. I'd been so wrapped up in my feelings for Isaac that I'd almost forgotten about my awesome news. I waved goodbye to Shanice and Hannah and climbed into the car. Everyone else had gone home earlier, and Mom had come back after additions. Guess what, Mom? I chirped. I got in. She switched her phone to her other ear. That's great, honey. She smiled sweetly and went back to her conversation like I'd just announced my teacher had given me a sticker for being a good kid in class that day. I bit my lip. The entire drive home she droned on and on to some lady at church about which Cub Scout had earned what award. Mom was the Cub Master, and she took it way too seriously. I kept expecting her to hang up to congratulate me some more or to ask me how I'd managed to find out I'd gotten in during my audition, but she never did. She stayed on the phone until we were home, and by then, I'd given up trying to tell her how excited I was about my news. I trudged to my room. Olivia lay on her bed with her legs sticking up and crossed, reading the last few pages of her latest vampire book. She had an addictive problem. Guess what? I said. What? She mumbled, not looking up from the page. I got into Primus. Her lips wrinkled but she kept her eyes down. Quit lying. You did not. Yeah, I did. You just told me last night he'd be putting the results up tomorrow. Yeah, well, I'm telling you now he accepted me on the spot. Her shoulders tensed for a moment. She sat up and looked at me with a wry smile. I know why. Uh. I didn't like the way she was looking at me. Okay, why? She shot two fingers up with a self-satisfied expression. One, because you're Michael's sister, and he was planning on letting you in before you even auditioned. Mr. Bird would never do that. He's known for being totally unbiased. Don't interrupt. Two, because you're a Mormon. Everyone knows he's fascinated by Mormons. Mr. Bird did really love Mormons, but he would never pick favorites like that. Would he? The door cracked open. Destiny, I need your help in the kitchen. Mom turned and walked back toward the kitchen. I followed her. Me? What about Olivia? She's just lying there reading some sappy vampire book, and I still have chemistry homework. She doesn't have to help tonight, Mom said from over her shoulder. What was that supposed to mean? When we got in the kitchen, she pulled her apron down from its peg. She lowered the neck loop over her messy bun and knotted it around her waist. Go set the table with plates and make sure you get out the chopsticks. We're having Thai coconut curry tonight. I wrinkled my nose. I hated curry. Thank goodness we didn't have it very often. I set the table and kept hoping mom would say something about my primus audition, but she never brought it back up. So about my audition, I said putting a stack of red cups on the table. No. Pull out the glass cups. We're not using plastic tonight. Okay. We usually used the plastic ones, but whatever. I switched out the cups and continued setting the table, finishing off by adding a set of chopsticks next to every plate. It looked like I'd be eating plain white rice tonight. At least mom liked to cook with jasmine rice. 
if I melted butter on it, it wouldn't be too bland. Thirty minutes later, the family was seated around the table, and we were taking turns filling up our plates. So what's the occasion? Michael said, waving a hand from a bowl of curry to the fancier glasses. Olivia, why don't you share your news with everyone? Mom speared a piece of chicken, tinted yellow from the spices. She smiled at Olivia like they were best friends who shared some huge girly secret. My eyes flicked from the yellow chicken, stuck to her fork, to Olivia's smug face and something clicked. Thai curry chicken was Olivia's all-time favorite food. She liked it better than pie or cookies or milkshakes. Michael raised his eyebrows at Olivia expectantly. Olivia cleared her smug expression and shrugged like it was no big deal. She made first chair, Elijah said, rolling his brown eyes. With his dark features, he was a lot like Michael, only sarcastic. First chair? Dad said, looking up from his plate. He tended to zone out during dinner. Nothing could come between Dad and his food. Yeah, it means she's the best flutist in the middle school band, Mom gushed. Well, I guess that practicing sure paid off. Dad smiled and Mom beamed at Olivia like she was the pride and joy of the family. The fact that Dad noticed Olivia had put in a lot of time practicing spoke volumes. He was usually so busy he had no clue what was really going on in our lives, but Olivia had driven the entire family nuts with her flute obsession all summer long. Let's all just worship her now, Elijah muttered. I bit my lip to keep from smiling. The kid was mirroring my attitude perfectly. I leaned over to Elijah and said, I think you're onto something there. We should just make a statue of Olivia so we can worship her even when she's not home. I shoveled a forkful of buttered rice into my mouth. What's your problem, Destiny? Mom said. My problem? I don't have a problem. Michael studied me with a quizzical expression. You never told me how your Primus audition went today. I stared at the buttery rice and swallowed back the retort on the tip of my tongue. Michael didn't deserve my wrath. I got in, I said barely above a whisper. What? He picked up his glass of ice water and took a long swallow. She just said she got in, Brianna said. She'd pushed all the broccoli and red peppers to the edge of her plate. Michael set his cup down and gawked at me. You mean you already know? I glanced toward Mom. I nodded, hesitantly. Was Olivia right? Had I gotten in because Mr. Bird played favorites? Michael gave a low whistle. Dang. You must have totally aced the audition. A hint of a smile played on my lips. He had no idea how much I needed to hear that. Well, I definitely didn't mess anything up. At least not that I know of. Did you hear that, Dad? Michael asked. What? Dad looked up from his plate and wiped his mouth. Destiny just got accepted into Primus. And it was during her audition. Mr. Bird never does that unless he's super impressed. My eyes widened. Olivia looked at me and smirked like she knew better. Dad cleared his throat. That's great, Destiny. I'm not really surprised, though. I've always thought you had a beautiful voice. Olivia's expression soured. Thanks, Dad. I followed Hannah through the growing crowd huddled around the choir door. When we made it to the sign, we scanned the names. I made it, she said, letting out a huge breath of air. We pushed away from the crowd. For a while there, I wasn't sure. Look. Hudson, Shanice, Deshawn. They all got in. I scanned the list again. Wait, you're an alto? I thought Isaac said you could get in as a soprano. As soon as the words left my mouth, I regretted them. What if Hannah felt really bad that she didn't the part she wanted? Hannah shrugged. I didn't try out as a soprano. It bores me. I'm not friends with any of the sopranos anyway. Alto pride all the way. She high-fived me and then spun back around to the posted names. Wait a second. 
Did you happen to notice if Evan got in? No, I forgot to look. I squinted at the list to see if Evan's name was there, but the crowd blocked my view. Finally, Evan turned from the sign with a giant smile on his face. He shoved through the crowd and headed toward us. Congratulations, ladies. I saw you both got in. Thanks, Evan. Hannah beamed. So what about you? His face fell. No. Oh, no. Are you serious? His face spread into a dimpled smile. Actually, no. I'm not serious. Hannah punched his arm. You freaking liar. He dodged away, his dimples deepening. The door to the choir room opened, and we crowded into the classroom for our first session singing with Primus. My heart did a little happy dance inside my ribcage. Shanice and Deshaun, who'd been getting awfully cozy lately, followed behind us, laughing loudly. She smacked him playfully and then took a seat on the front row of the alto section. Aspen and Jesse argued on the front row of the soprano section, and Aspen looked away with an annoyed expression. Mr. Bird directed us to assign spots, referring to his seating chart. Why do I have to sit on the front row? Jesse whined. Mr. Bird spoke without looking up from his paper. Two reasons. One, you're short. She huffed in protest, but he continued as if he hadn't heard her, and two, it makes a difference in the sound. You're seated according to the strength and tone of your voice. Destiny, you will be on the second row, directly next to the tenor section, he said, pointing to my square on his paper. I spotted Hannah's name on the second row, two seats down from me. Between us sat a quiet girl from the junior class named Abigail, who had auburn hair and a slouched form. I climbed to the second row and slid into my seat. Isaac strode into the room, looking like a model, laughing with his friends. Isaac spotted Hannah and said, Hannah. You got in. He grabbed her and squeezed her in a giant bear hug. She squealed and pushed him away. Isaac climbed to the second row of the tenor section, only two seats down from me. Play it cool, Destiny. Ultra aware of his presence, I peeked over at him. He bent to unzip his backpack, his shoulders tight against his white starched shirt, and a lock of his dark hair fell into his eyes. I had the sudden urge to reach out and sweep it back for him. He glanced up and caught me staring at him. My cheeks flamed. I was about to look away, but his face broke out into an easy smile. Destiny. Hey. Hey, Isaac. Joshua walked our way and sat in the empty seat between us. I blinked in surprise. A freshman got into the tenor section? I guess it made sense that, other than Isaac, the one person who could get in as a freshman would be his little brother. I have to sit next to you all year long? Joshua said. My eyes widened in shock. Was he talking to me? Isaac answered him, and I realized he meant his brother. I'm afraid so. Try not to get too upset about it. Joshua regarded me, a devilish smile, crossing his features. Cool, I get to sit next to Destiny. Isaac gave him a strange look. Haven't you heard? Destiny, and I have it all planned out. What was he talking about? Trying to look disinterested, I busied myself with pulling out a pencil and my water bottle. She promised if I became a Mormon, she'd be one of my multiple wives. I almost snapped my pencil in half. Joshua? He was the Josh from the bus? I bit my lip. How was I supposed to sit next to him for the rest of the year? Now any time I wanted to look at Isaac, I'd have to look past Josh first? Ugh. I turned my entire body as far away from him as I could. Just after the words had tumbled from his mouth, I heard a small yelp. I glanced over my shoulder. Isaac had his fingers curled around his brother's arm and his face close to Josh's ear, whispering urgently. Josh screwed his face up in pain and shook Isaac's hand off his arm. Dude, leave me alone. What's with you? I turned away and blushed. Was Isaac defending my honor, or was he telling his little brother it was impolite to bash the Mormons in front of them? 
Although he came from a well-known Mormon-hating family, I had no idea what Isaac himself thought about us. When everyone was settled in their seats, Mr. Bird passed out the black music folders. I passed the folders to Josh without looking in his direction. The sight of him made me sick to my stomach. I glanced around the room and made a decision. I wasn't going to let Josh ruin my first day in Primus. He didn't deserve the satisfaction of knowing he'd hurt me. I was going to pretend he didn't say it, and I was going to enjoy singing with this epic choir. Everyone, stand. Mr. Bird lifted a fist toward the basses and sang a deep awe. Powerful male voices boomed through the room. He added the tenors, and Josh and Isaac's beautiful voices joined the basses, their notes slightly higher. Even higher yet, he added the altos, and I sang my notes steadily. Finally, he added the sopranos, and their clear high note completed the harmony. The voices combined like a brilliant rainbow of sound. He moved our voices through a few more harmonies, and I listened and followed his lead carefully through the complicated vocal exercises. When he seemed satisfied with our warm-up, he lowered his hands and said, Open John Rutter's The Lord is My Shepherd. My music folder had a loop in the back for my fingers and a strap in the bottom that kept the music from falling during performances. The front pocket contained a stack of music. There were two other John Rutter pieces in addition to The Lord is My Shepherd. Not surprising. I'd sung several Rudder songs before, and each one had inspired me. I continued flipping through the music. Other than a Mozart piece, I wasn't familiar with the rest. The piano began with a lengthy intro, and the feminine voices started the song with such clear, piercing notes that goosebumps rose on my arms. Masculine voices took over, and the music wrapped around me like a warm, velour blanket. Isaac's distinctive tenor voice rang out strong with solid pitch. A chill ran down my spine. When Primus had performed The Lord is My Shepherd last year, it had left me awestruck, but I never could have ever prepared myself for this. It was one thing to hear Primus from the congregation, but it was an entirely different thing to experience it nestled among the singers with the amazing acoustics of the choir room. Before we got up to leave, Mr. Bird made an announcement. For those of you who don't know, I am putting together a production of Les Miserables. It will be a year-long effort. We'll still be singing our regular regimen of music for the church, and we'll have a Christmas program. But, I've wanted to do Les Mis for a long time, and I think I finally have the right group this year. He stacked up his papers and closed his folder. Additions will be held the first Friday in October. I'm giving you a good four weeks to prepare, so I'm expecting to see your best work. The bell rang. Come up here and grab a flyer with more information about the audition. How'd your first day go? Abigail said from beside me. It was great. You're Michael's little sister, right? Yep. Michael has an excellent voice. You seem pretty decent yourself. Thanks. I smiled. I can't believe we're singing Les Mis. I've wanted to be in that musical since I was a kid, Abigail said from beside me. I shrugged. As a newbie and one of the youngest members of the choir, I knew I'd probably just be in the chorus. I'm actually surprised we're allowed to perform it, Abigail continued. Some of the content could be considered questionable. Mr. Bird will probably do what he can to clean it up, I said. I hadn't thought of that, Abigail said. I followed her to the podium to join the crowd grabbing the audition flyers. By the time I picked one up, the room had emptied. I walked over to drop off my folder into my cubby, and voices floated from Mr. Bird's office, a small room connected to the choir room. I crouched in front of the cubbies and found a slot with my name labeled beneath it and reached to place my folder inside. You should cast Destiny and Isaac together. Don't you think they'd have good chemistry on stage? My hand froze midair in front of the cubby. It was Hannah talking. If she got to sing with him it would be a dream come true for her. Was she for real? Mr. Bird chuckled and said, it could be a possibility. I'll give it some thought. I stalked out into the hall, fists clenched, to confront Hannah from the hallway entrance of Mr. Bird's office. I stopped mid-stride. 
Josh leaned against the wall, directly across the hall from Mr. Bird's office, with an amused expression on his face. He turned, saw me, and his smile grew wider. Hannah breezed out of the office. The smug satisfaction on her face transformed to astonishment the moment she saw Josh. Nice job, Hannah, Josh said. You weren't supposed to hear that. Hasn't anyone ever told you that eavesdropping is bad manners? She turned in my direction and almost jumped out of her skin. Destiny, she exclaimed. Hannah, we need to have a little talk. I grabbed her arm and led her away from Josh. I pulled her into the nearby girl's locker room and forced the door shut. What was that? Uh, what exactly did you hear? I heard you telling Mr. Bird about my crush in front of Josh. I wanted to go home, crawl into bed, pull the covers over my head, and stay there for a week. I didn't know Josh was listening. It was supposed to be a private conversation. Maybe next time, you should pick a setting more private than directly after choir, or at least shut the door. I strained to keep my voice from escalating. Spots began to form before my eyes. I don't know what you were trying to achieve, but you ended up making me look desperate. You obviously didn't see the look on his face. He was seriously considering it. So not funny. I wasn't trying to be. I actually wanted you and Isaac to be cast together, she said, her voice escalating. But why? I threw my hands out in fury. That doesn't even make a bit of sense. I thought you wanted him for yourself. No. How many times do I have to tell you I don't like him, that way? She was lying. She had to be. How can that possibly be true? Haven't you noticed how many girls fight over him? He's totally gorgeous, and he clearly likes you. Did y'all used to date or something? Is that why you hate Aspen so much? I don't hate her. I just think she's totally fake and annoying. Isaac deserves better, Hannah explained. You didn't answer the question. Did you used to date Isaac? She pushed past me. I have to get to class. Why do you care so much? I demanded as she walked away, but she didn't answer. I stared after her, stifling the urge to scream in frustration. Why wouldn't she just answer me? I had study hall next, but I wasn't up for it. I sat on one of the long benches that ran the length of the room. I needed time to clear my head and cool down. The bell rang but I didn't move from my spot. I sat with my legs crossed and rested my chin on a fist. Eventually, I drifted off. A haughty voice, coming from the door to the gym woke me. Trevor, I think Isaac might be cheating on me with the Mormon girl. My jaw almost hit the floor. I sat up fully, jolted awake. Can you go talk to him for me, you know, man to man? Her voice sounded coy, like she was trying to seduce him into getting her information. What's in it for me, he asked in a husky voice. You can't just do it out of the goodness of your heart, she said. I could just imagine her batting her eyes at him. His voice grew firm. You're asking me to accuse my buddy of cheating. Fine, she huffed. I'll do your half of our group history project. What do you want me to say? Trevor asked with renewed interest in his voice. Just try to figure out what he wants with her. He's really distracted and ultra-focused on her. It's starting to mess with me. Her voice quivered. Please, Trevor. He grunted an agreement, and she let out a relieved sigh. Oh, thank you. I just saw him in his office. If you go straight there, you should be able to catch him. I dashed out of the locker room, back the way I'd come. I peered around the corner to see Trevor headed toward Isaac's office. I didn't know what I expected to discover. Deep down, I longed to hear Isaac admit that he wanted me instead of Aspen. But not only was that bogus, it was heartless. I'd seen Aspen and Isaac at the retreat. They'd been so in love. Guilt burned on my cheeks. Still, I followed Trevor hurrying to catch up as he turned the corner closest to Isaac's office. 
As I approached Isaac's office, I slowed and pressed my body against the wall before turning the corner so Trevor couldn't see me. Hey, you got a minute? Trevor said. Yeah, sure. What's going on? Isaac replied. He launched into a series of questions about the football season, and just as I began contemplating slipping away, he said, what's up with you and the Mormon girl lately? Are you guys a thing? I see you together, all the time. No, no. I'm still with Aspen, Isaac reassured him. Are you? It seems like you've really got destiny wrapped around your little finger. Yeah, I guess I kinda do, Isaac said in a matter-of-fact voice. What? That arrogant jerk. He was completely aware of my crush, and it was like he was somehow going to use it to his advantage. But why? You're definitely not interested in her? No, I'm with Aspen. I'm not actually interested in her at all. Ouch. Stab me in the heart already. Isaac continued on his tirade, it's something else, okay? Get off my back, dude. Something else? What did he mean by that? Okay, okay. No need to get all defensive. How could I have been so wrong? I'd been so sure I'd seen something genuine in Isaac's eyes that day after my audition. Whatever he was doing, I completely fell for it. I felt so incredibly stupid. Hot tears burned in my eyes as I turned and fled. As I neared the choir room, Dr. Robinson's southern drawl floated from Mr. Bird's office. My son Josh just came to me with some very disturbing news. Am I to understand that you are considering casting my son with a Mormon as his love interest in the upcoming musical? Dr. Robinson spat the word, Mormon, like it was poison in his mouth, he wanted to get out. He might as well have spit it in my face, because it stung like acid. Is that a problem? Mr. Bird laughed like he couldn't believe he was even having such a ridiculous conversation. My casting process is based on the level of talent, hard work, and ability to follow directions. I don't see how religion affects the performance. The last thing I want my son thinking about is dating a girl with her background. With all due respect, I have a show to run. I intend to create the best cast possible. If you aren't comfortable with Isaac dating a Mormon, then perhaps you should speak to him about that. Last I checked, he was already dating Aspen, so you should have nothing to be concerned about. Josh is concerned that Isaac might be interested in this girl. I didn't give it much weight until I learned the rumor that Isaac and Destiny had chemistry. If that's true, this has to stop now. My son cannot be involved with a Mormon, Dr. Robinson bellowed. Frankly, I don't even understand why they're still here. If it had been up to me, they would have left years ago when they became Mormons. I couldn't stand to listen to any more. Rushing down the hall, Back to the locker room, I hid in a stall and exhaled to release the tension built up inside me. I really needed to stop eavesdropping. It was starting to affect my health. Wild thoughts swirled through my mind, and tears formed in my eyes. What were Aspen and Dr. Robinson so worried about anyway? It wasn't like Isaac actually cared about me. For a moment it had felt like he did especially at Hannah's house and then, just before my audition. I'd felt something between us. It actually did feel like we'd had chemistry between us. I just couldn't figure out why he'd been hanging around me so much lately. If he didn't want to date me, then why bother? I closed my eyes and imagined a world where Isaac really did have true feelings for me, that the chemistry was real. Creating a fantasy of Isaac tiring of Aspen, breaking up with her and then sweeping me off my feet was easy. But it wasn't real. I opened my eyes. Isaac still wanted her. It didn't matter how shallow or conniving she happened to be. He still wanted her, and I was doomed to live life alone and rejected. Chapter 13, Isaac My fingers plucked an odd tune as I sat on my bed with my guitar resting on my crossed legs. I was all out of creativity. No matter how I switched it up, I couldn't get the melody right on the song I was composing. I gripped the guitar to keep myself from tossing it across the room. An engine roared outside. 
I glanced up to see Aspen's red Mustang pulling into the driveway. The door opened, and the top of her blonde head appeared as she stepped out of the car. I put my guitar in its case on the floor. I ran my hands through my hair in agitation. I wasn't in the mood to see her. I was 99% sure she'd put Trevor up to cornering me about destiny. I didn't appreciate it. If she'd had concerns, she should have come to me to talk about it instead of getting my buddies involved. Who else had she told? Despite what I'd told Trevor, I'd been getting sucked in by destiny more and more, and I wasn't sure what to do about it. I hated the idea of betraying Aspen in any way, but it was my duty to protect the school. I lifted the double-paned glass and leaned outside. I'd taken the screen off my window long ago so I could climb onto the roof to watch the stars fill the sky at night. Hey there. You coming to see me? I called down to her. She looked up and flashed me a seductive smile. Guess what, she sang, swaying her hips, I brought you a surprise. My eyes lingered on her hips for a moment, before trailing back up to her face. She waved a brown paper bag with a pig on the front. You brought barbecue? My anger melted away. Smoky Bones was my favorite. My mouth watered just thinking about it. Have I told you lately how much I love you? She flashed her perfect smile. Only every day. Go ahead and let yourself in. I'll be right down. My irritation over the issue with Trevor forgotten, I pounded down the stairs, not sure whether I was more excited to see her or to eat smoky bones. I wrapped my arms around her tiny waist, buried my face in her blonde, wavy hair, and breathed in coconut. You always smell like you just came back from the beach. She laughed. What do you expect? I work at Hollister. We polished off our barbecue sandwiches and settled on the couch. I rented the new musical you said you wanted to watch, Aspen crooned. I clearly remembered her saying she wanted to watch it. I bit back the response sitting on the tip of my tongue. She had gotten me barbecue, after all. Instead, I replied, I'll take any excuse I can get to cuddle with you on the couch. After the movie, Aspen turned to me, her voice serious. We need to talk. About what? I asked, my defenses kicking into gear. I keep thinking about you spending time with that stupid Mormon girl. I resisted the urge to squirm. What are you talking about? I haven't been spending that much time with her. She looked up at me, her eyes large and vulnerable. Yes, Isaac. You have. Dang it. How did she have such a hold on me? I released a breath. I don't like her like that. As soon as the words left my mouth I knew they weren't true. I see the way you look at her. She lifted a strand of her hair. I may be blonde, but I'm not stupid. I have another reason for wanting to talk to her. Isaac. You know I've heard enough lies from my dad, she said, I don't need it from you, too. That's not fair. You can't assume I'm going to betray you just because your dad did. She angled her body away from me. Hey, I said, tilting her chin toward me. Look at me. She pushed my hand away, the scowl, still on her face. There's something you don't know about. I put up a hand when she started to protest. Don't get mad. Let me explain. She glared at me, but didn't say anything. It started on the retreat. Will came in late the first night. He told me Destiny had been trying to convert Hannah. You know how I worry about her. Aspen stared at the wall, still refusing to make eye contact. Will thought I should tell my dad, but she's so rebellious. She'd do the opposite of whatever my dad wanted just to spite him. I don't see how it gives you permission to hang around that Mormon. Let me finish. She let out an exasperated breath. Will and I came up with a plan to get Hannah away from destiny. What kind of plan, she asked in a flat voice. I'd go make friends with destiny to dig up dirt on the Mormons. Then once we found out enough of their secrets, we'd go tell the school board to see if we can get the Mormons kicked out for good. Why you? 
Why doesn't some other guy go be BFFs with her? I almost told her about Destiny's crush on me, but I hesitated. It probably wouldn't help my case to bring it up. We have something in common. How adorable, she sneered. What would that be? I can use Hannah as an excuse to see Destiny. I wanted to add without making it look like I'm hitting on her, but I didn't dare. Aspen was quiet for a long time. I still don't like it. You have to trust me. I'm just doing this for Hannah. I held her palms to mine and stroked my thumbs over the back of her hands. Her shoulders relaxed and she shifted around so her back leaned against me. Why had I thought it was a good idea to tell her? Aspen left, and I headed up to my room for the night. Talking to her about destiny had drained me, and I longed for some sleep. Just as I settled into my covers, a knock sounded at my door. Come in, I said. Dad entered, and I sat up in bed. We need to talk, son. What's going on? Your brother Josh came to my office this afternoon with some disturbing news. What kind of disturbing news? I understand that you have begun spending time with Destiny Clark and that there has been talk of chemistry between you. I don't know what's going on, but I don't like the sound of it. I just survived a lecture from Aspen about Destiny. I didn't want to hear it from my dad, too. I have no idea what you're talking about, I said in a bored voice. Don't take that tone with me, he said with a note of warning. I have a girlfriend. I don't like Destiny that way. Why was it that every time I repeated that statement it seemed a bit more untrue? Then why does Hannah think so? I don't know, Dad, I said, adding an extra layer of annoyance to my words for good measure. Hannah's, just being Hannah. You know how her imagination always runs wild. But that doesn't mean that there's a shred of truth involved. I avoided his gaze with the hope that he wouldn't read the lie on my face. I had to be more careful around Hannah in the future. This plan to protect the school was spiraling out of my control. I considered telling Dad, but quickly decided against it. If word of my plan got back to Hannah, she'd probably start sneaking off to church with Destiny just to spite us all. Chapter 14 Destiny Cannonball The Nelson twins shouted in unison. They ran across the cement and launched into my family's pool interrupting a game of Marco Polo they hadn't seemed to notice. Their heads popped up out of the water, and they gave each other toothy smiles. Gavin. Elliot, my mom called to them as though they were her own. They spun around and looked at her with huge eyes. Be careful when you jump into the pool. They were playing a game and you could have hurt somebody. The mouth-watering smell of burgers and chicken wings on the grill wafted over from the deck. I leaned back in the hot tub and sighed. We hadn't had the Nelsons over to swim since the school year had started. With all the stress of additions and the drama surrounding Isaac, I was relieved when Mom suggested earlier in the week that we invite them over for a Labor Day bash to get in one final swim day before the cold season hit. Megan shook her head with a smile as she watched her nine-year-old brother's antics. She had her light brown hair piled up on her head into a messy bun similar to the one I wore. I swear those twins never stop moving until their heads hit their pillows at night. Let's get revenge. Elijah hooped, and Olivia and Brinley shoved huge handfuls of water toward the twins, and an all-out war broke loose. Sister Nelson came out of the house with Anna, her youngest, and began helping her into her floaties. Anna promptly began to fuss, squirming free of her grasp. Her mother grabbed her arm again, fighting to hold her steady. A pesky tuft of hair fell into her face, and she blew on it, only to have it flop right back down into her eyes. Preston stepped out the kitchen door behind her and said, I got this, Mom. He bent over his five-year-old sister and helped her slide her arms into the inflated sleeves. Anna immediately calmed at his touch. He dropped to a knee and helped her take her sandals off. Sister Nelson sunk into a nearby chair, and blew out a puff of air before leaning her head back and closing her eyes. Anna ran off and climbed down the steps to join the other kids in the water. Brinley grabbed her hands and swung her around in the water. Preston stretched out in a lawn chair on the far side of the pool next to Michael. 
Preston grabbed the hem of his shirt and pulled it over his head. I bit my lip and looked away. When had he gotten so muscular? I'd been so distracted with school lately, I'd barely even seen him, which was unusual, since he practically lived at our place. So how'd your Primus audition go? Megan asked. I jumped at her words. Hopefully, she hadn't noticed me checking her brother out. That would have been weird. I cleared my throat. Audition? I asked, my mind still a bit foggy from the realization that Preston had somehow gotten so hot without me noticing. Oh. Um. It went great. I got in. That's awesome. I guess. So much had happened since I'd found out that I'd gotten in that it didn't even feel like much of a victory at this point. You don't sound very excited about it, Megan observed. Feeling overwarm, I pushed up out of the water and sat on the edge of the hot tub, stretching my feet over the roiling foam. There's been a lot going on. Feel like talking about it, she asked. I watched the swirling bubbles. They looked like my insides felt, chaotic and moving around so quickly it was hard to make sense of any of it. I'm so tired of getting mixed signals from Isaac. I can't figure out what he wants. He keeps approaching me and acting interested, but then I overhear him talking to his friends, and he completely denies that he feels anything for me. I told her about how Hannah went to Mr. Bird about casting me with Isaac and Les Mis, Aspen approaching Trevor, and Isaac denying that he was interested in me. Trevor started making jokes, saying that Isaac had me wrapped around his little finger, and Isaac agreed. It was so humiliating. I feel like such an idiot. I want to stop liking him, but every time I try he pops up out of nowhere, acting all interested in my life and asking me questions. I just don't know what to do, Megan. I don't think you need to do anything. Just focus on your schoolwork and work on getting ready for your Les Mis audition. I wasn't so sure I wanted to try out for Les Mis, especially after all this drama, but I didn't bother telling Megan that. But what am I supposed to do if Isaac starts trying to talk to me again? Destiny, you have a good head on your shoulders. You just need to trust yourself to make good decisions. I can't answer that for you. I slipped back down into the water. But if it was you, what would you do? I asked intently. Megan grinned. I'd flirt right back. Isaac's hot. I laughed and splashed her. But what about if I catch him mocking me to his friends again? First of all, he was probably lying. You're pretty. There's no way he doesn't want you. But if I heard him talking smack about me to his friends, I'd march right in there and give him a piece of my mind. I couldn't imagine soft-spoken Megan standing up to Isaac, but then again, I'd seen her getting her little brothers in line, so maybe there was a tough side to her, after all. You sound like Hannah, I said with a small laugh. She's always threatening to kick his butt for me. Maybe it's time you learn to start standing up for yourself. Maybe you're right, I said in a soft voice. I spent the morning avoiding Hannah. I sat across the room from her in geometry, so it was easy to act absorbed in my work. When she spotted me by my locker earlier, I pretended to not notice and managed to shake her off by getting swallowed by the crowd. A rumble of voices greeted me as I walked into the crowded lunchroom, my brown sack in tow. I stood on my tiptoes and scanned the room, contemplating whether I should sit at my regular lunch table or by myself. Have you picked out your audition song for Les Mis? Hannah asked, sidling up next to me. Was she really going to act like nothing had happened between us? I'm not planning to audition, I said with an edge of frost in my voice. I'll probably just be in the chorus. Don't waste your time, Destiny, Jessie said, walking up with her lunch tray. Mr. Bird is super picky about who he casts. Jessie shot me a fake sympathetic smile over her shoulder as she sauntered off to her usual table with the cheerleaders. My cheeks burned. Do you want me to go tell her what's what? Hannah asked. No, I turned away from Hannah and spotted a table in the back corner of the lunchroom. Where are you going? Hannah asked. I'm sitting over there. I pointed. Why, she asked. 
didn't she get it? I exhaled. I want to be alone. I walked to the back table and sat down, pulling a sandwich from my crumpled bag. To my surprise, Isaac came over and said, Hey, how are you feeling about Lesma's additions? I don't know, I said, glancing over at the table where Hannah sat with Shanice and Hudson. She must have gotten the message. Is everything okay? he asked, following my gaze to my normal lunch table. I considered forcing a smile and saying that I was just fine, but an idea popped into my head. It was bold and gutsy, but, if Isaac was so eager to talk to me, maybe I could use it to my advantage. Can I ask you a question? Sure, Isaac said. What's the deal with you and Hannah? Obviously, something's been going on between you, but she won't tell me, and now I'm starting to wonder if you guys used to date or something. Isaac did something that caught me off guard. He let loose a peal of laughter. Date? He shook his head. You mean you still don't know? Know what? I asked, my irritation growing. Hannah's my cousin. Your cousin? I sputtered. My mind raced. So that's why they seemed so close. Why would she lie to me about that? I thought back to the retreat when I'd first told her about my crush. She should have told me then that Isaac was her cousin. That's between you and Hannah. Something inside me snapped. I was so tired of being pushed around by everyone around me. Jesse Snide remarks, Josh bullying me for my religion, and Dr. Robinson's open disdain for me. But Hannah's betrayal was the worst, because I'd trusted her. I'd expected her to be straight with me. But she was Dr. Robinson's niece, and I was beginning to wonder if all of his family wasn't to be trusted. I looked at Isaac, with a realization that he wasn't exactly my friend either. He was a Robinson, after all. I glared at him. Why are you talking to me? What do you want? I, uh, he stuttered. The words spilled from my mouth of their own accord. You think you have me wrapped around your little finger? His eyes bulged. Well, guess what? I spat. You don't. I don't know what you want from me, but I don't like you, and I wish you'd stay away. He stared at me, stunned. He opened his mouth to speak, but then closed it again. The suave, polished Isaac Robinson was actually at a loss for words. It was like no one had ever dared speak to him like that before. I picked up my sandwich and began eating it with the hope that he'd get the hint and leave me alone. I didn't look at him when he got up to leave, but out of the corner of my eye I caught a glimpse of him sitting down at his normal table with Aspen. Maybe Jesse was right. What if I really didn't have what it took to get into a musical? I was lucky enough to get into Primus. Olivia could have been right all along, and Mr. Bird only let me in the choir because he liked how Mormons added diversity to the group. It was hard to know what the truth was. Maybe I really was just a mediocre singer, and no one bothered to tell me because they wanted to spare my feelings. The thoughts tortured me mercilessly for the rest of the day. Somehow, I made it through my classes, homework, and dinner dishes. After wiping the last crumbs from the dinner table and tossing the rag in the sink, I found Michael sitting in my dad's study, watching YouTube videos of Les Mis songs. He looked up and smiled, his face bright. Hey, Destiny. Hey, I forced a smile. Just because my life sucked didn't mean I had to be a Debbie Downer around Michael. What are you up to? I'm trying to decide the role I want to land for Les Mis, Michael said, his brow furrowed as he studied the screen. He glanced over at me. You'd make a killer Epinine. I didn't even know who that was. It had been years since I'd seen Les Mis, and I didn't remember the names of the characters. I guess, I said. Is everything okay? he asked, his eyes full of concern. I shrugged. You're auditioning, too, right? I wasn't planning on it. He crossed his arms. That's a mistake. If you don't audition, you'll regret it. What's the point? It's not like I'm actually good enough. You're much better than you think. But in reality, none of us start out good enough. Well, except a few very lucky people. 
but most of us have to work hard to get there, Michael said sagely. I sat for a minute and let his words sink in as he kept browsing songs. The music was powerful and spoke to me. Who's that? I asked. That's Jean Valjean, he said. He's the main character and gets thrown in jail for years for stealing a loaf of bread. It's the story of his redemption. You'd be awesome as him. That's who I'm hoping to get. But it's the lead, so I'll have to work hard to get it, he said with his jaw set in determination. Why couldn't I be more like Michael? I was wrapped up in my own misery, missing an opportunity to grow and become an amazing singer. I had to show them how amazing I could be. I was tired of people mistreating me. I had to get Isaac to realize I wasn't a desperate loser. I had to get him off my back, but I didn't know how. When I entered the library for study hall the next day, I spotted Hannah sitting at one of the round tables. Without meeting her eye, I took a seat next to Hudson at a table on the other side of the room. He looked up from his open chemistry book. He brushed his hair from his eyes. Well, hello, hello, he said with a crooked grin. Hey, I pulled out a chair and plunked myself down. How's the studying going? Ugh, he grimaced. I huffed. I know what you mean. Chemistry isn't my strongest subject. I'm more into the arts singing, reading, and writing. Yeah, I'm more of a race my longboard down a wicked, steep hill kind of guy myself, he said with a shrug. I laughed and realized how much tension I'd been holding inside myself for the past few days. A shadow appeared over our table. I looked up to see Hannah standing there with a solemn expression. What do you want? I muttered, avoiding her eyes. Can I talk to you for a minute? She jerked her head toward her table. Okay. I gathered my books and followed her to her table. I settled into a chair and looked up at her. What's up? I want to apologize about what happened with Josh. Her eyes were full of remorse. The hardened expression on my face slipped away. I thought I was being discreet, but I guess I'm bad at that kind of thing. I thought you would be happy. I'm sorry. I released a slow breath. I guess I can see that. It was too bad Josh happened to be there. I never would have said anything if I'd realized it. I believe you. Good. Friends? Hannah asked. Sure. And I'm sorry for the way I treated you at lunch yesterday, but we need to talk about something. Her brows knit together. Yeah. Isaac told me the truth about how you really know each other. She looked down into her hands. Oh. Was that all she could say? Why did you feel like you had to hide that from me? I don't get it. She was quiet for a moment. Finally she spoke up. It's true. Isaac's my cousin. And I didn't come to the school because Evan's family recommended it. I lied to you about that, and I'm sorry. My parents forced me to come here because I got in trouble at my old school. I was so angry. You have no idea. I'm sorry, Hannah. I didn't want anyone to know, and I thought that if I pretended to not know Isaac, I could get a fresh start and make friends on my own terms. I just wish you'd trusted me enough to tell me. I know. I thought about it a bunch of times, but I guess I just chickened out. I paused and then blurted, I still feel bad that I got so angry about you telling Mr. Bird about my feelings for Isaac. It's okay, I get it. Sometimes I can get a little out of hand, and I don't always think everything through. Aspen and Isaac walked past the open library door, and I caught a flash of him wrapping his fingers around hers. I can't keep going on like this, I leaned forward, whispering furiously. I have to put a stop to how I feel about Isaac. What? Why? These feelings don't have a place in my life right now. I need you to tell him I don't like him anymore. Destiny, she said in a breathy whisper. I glanced around to make sure we weren't drawing too much attention to ourselves and scooted in closer. I don't want him to think I'm desperate. This is how you can make up the Mr. Bird incident to me. How am I supposed to get him to believe me? 
Tell him it was all your idea, that you were trying to set me up with him, so he'd break up with Aspen, since you hate her so much. I don't think he'll buy it. She had a good point. I needed some kind of proof. Maybe you could tell him I'm dating someone else. Someone like Preston? Hannah. You're a genius. I even have a picture of us together. Megan took it of us at the last church dance. I pulled my phone from my backpack and scrolled through my pictures until I found the right one. See? The screen displayed a picture of me wearing my favorite blue dress, with soft curls, tumbling down my back. Preston and I stood cheek to cheek, making cheesy faces, for the camera. We'd just been goofing off at the time, but it was a convincing picture for our plan. That's perfect. Text it to me. I promise I'll explain everything, and I'll show it to him to make up for embarrassing you. Deal? Deal. How soon can you show Isaac the picture? I guess I can show him on Sunday since I'll be at his house. You're going to his house? Yeah, we're having a family dinner there. It was crazy to think that she was his cousin and was involved with his family stuff. Call me as soon as you can after you show him and let me know if he seemed to actually believe you. But act natural. Oh, he'll believe me. I can be quite convincing when I want to be. I had to agree. She'd certainly fooled me before about how she didn't know Isaac. So about that audition song, I said. I was thinking I'd sing Think of Me from Phantom of the Opera. I'd loved the song for a long time, and my voice sounded strong whenever I sang it. Over the summer, I'd memorized it for fun. You can't sing that, Hannah said. Why not? I asked in frustration. I know I can totally rock that one. Because no one auditions with Phantom, she insisted. It's just never done. I don't get it. Think about it. Phantom is so overdone that every director is tired of hearing it. You need to audition with something a bit more obscure. Last year I sang How Could I Ever Know from The Secret Garden for my voice lessons. It's one of my favorite songs. I can bring a copy of the sheet music to school if you want. Hannah, you're a total lifesaver, I breathed. Chapter 15, Isaac I grabbed a slice of Aunt Bethany's famous homemade cheesecake and headed through my family's kitchen to go eat in front of the TV in the back room so I could check on the football game. Lucas was already sitting there completely engrossed in the game. Lucas. My man. What's the score? Although he was five years younger than me, Lucas and I were close. Whenever I clashed with Josh about something, Lucas almost always seemed to understand and agree with my side of things. He was my biggest fan, and even though he didn't go to Bethel, he went to all my football games and cheered me on. Tennessee's winning. 24 to nothing. It's gonna be a good day, he said in a chipper tone. I balanced my plate on my lap and lounged back on the sofa, eager to settle in for the game. Hey Isaac, can I talk to you? Hannah asked, sinking into the couch cushion next to me. Sure, what's up? I took a bite of a cookie. She glanced at her brother. Lucas, don't you have anything better to do? Better than watching football? He looked at her like she'd lost her mind. Can't you just leave for a minute? I'm trying to have a private conversation. No way. I was here first. Hannah, let's just go in the other room. Okay, she said. We went to the living room and sat on the couch, facing the grand piano. Did Josh tell you what he overheard me saying to Mr. Bird about the less miscasting? Are you kidding? He wouldn't keep something like that to himself. I snorted. I gotta hand it to you. It was real smooth. Shut up. She punched me in the arm. Believe me, I've been paying for it. Destiny was absolutely furious. Well, I kind of lied about the entire thing. You lied? What do you mean? If I tell you, you have to promise not to get mad at me. I rolled my eyes. Okay fine, I promise. Now tell me why you lied to Mr. Bird. You're going to think I'm dumb, but I had the whole thing planned out. 
I figured if I told him that Destiny liked you then he'd cast you two together, and then you'd fall for her and break up with Aspen. You think I'd betray Aspen? I'm not that kind of guy. I thought if you had the chance to spend more time with Destiny, you'd see what a great girl she is. I'm sure she's a great girl, but I already have an awesome girlfriend. I don't need a new one. Hannah frowned. Okay, I get it. Let me finish though. There's more? I could hear that the game had just come back on in the other room, and I was beyond ready to lose myself in some football. Destiny wasn't actually involved in any of this. And I'm supposed to believe that, why? She already has a boyfriend. His name is Preston. See? She held up her phone and showed me a picture of Destiny posing with some muscular dude. I've actually met him. I used to go to Acorn Creek with him. He's a nice guy. So she has a boyfriend. Why should I care? I said. You should care. She doesn't want him to find out there are rumors going around school that there might be something going on between the two of you. Apparently, he's the jealous type. Let me get this straight. I have to worry about some dude I've never even met who might want to fight me because of a lie you made up to break me and Aspen up. The look that crossed Hannah's face was comical. Uh. I hadn't thought about it that way, but yes. I crossed my arms over my chest. You get to be the one to tell Josh then. I want no part of this. Hannah left the room, and I pulled out my phone. I was half tempted to call Green to tell him the plan was off. I had way too much going on to deal with this ridiculous issue. I pushed the button on the side to wake up the screen, but nothing happened. Great. I'd forgotten to charge it last night, and now my battery was dead. Uncle Stephen, Isaac, get in here. You've got to see this game. Lucas called. I put the phone back into my pocket. Chapter 16, Destiny The chapel was full Sunday morning. The Nelson family sat right in front of ours like usual. Megan always sat directly in front of me, so it was easy to pass notes back and forth. Preston sat next to her, on the end of the pew, and I couldn't stop sneaking glances at him. If it got back to him that I'd started a rumor that he was my boyfriend, I would die. What would he say? Would he want to actually be my boyfriend? My heart thumped rapidly every time I looked in his direction and thought about it. It was so strange, the effect one simple lie could have on my brain. Suddenly, a small part of me began wondering what it would be like to make my little white lie a reality, and I found a tiny sliver of my heart wanting it to become so. Once I admitted that to myself, I couldn't take my eyes off of him. I found myself noticing things about him I'd never observed before, like how his hair swirled at the nape of his neck or the small cleft he had in his chin. After a while, he caught me staring at him, and I had to cut it out. I buried my face in my hands. What was wrong with me? Keeping my new feelings top secret was an absolute must. Not even Hannah could know. Especially not Preston's sisters or Olivia. Of all the people I knew, the only person allowed to know was Isaac. I slammed my locker shut and turned to Hannah. Did he buy it? Yup. He totally did. And for some reason, I think he was kind of jealous of Preston. Yeah right, I scoffed. No, Destiny, Hannah's tone was serious. I think he really was jealous. Isaac doesn't get the right to be jealous of anything. Not after the way he acted toward me, I said. What did he do? Hannah asked, her face darkening. I overheard him talking to Trevor about me the other day. I told her how I'd witnessed Aspen bribing Trevor to question Isaac about me, and Isaac's agreement when Trevor mentioned that Isaac had me wrapped around his little finger. What? Hannah squeaked. Do I need to go kick Isaac's butt for you? I sighed. No. I already talked to him. I kind of chewed him out for it, I admitted. You chewed out Isaac? Hannah asked with awe. I knew you had it in you. I'm proud of you, Destiny. It's not cool how much people pick on you. 
I say, kick all their butts. I'm pretty sure violence isn't the answer. Hannah giggled. I didn't mean literally. After school, I went online and studied the videos from every production of The Secret Garden I could find. I played and replayed the song, analyzing every word, every note, and every emotion it held. By the time Mom had dinner on the table, I had the song just about memorized. I talked with Megan at our Wednesday night church meeting, showed her the music, and asked her opinion on the best ways to portray the character. Michael and I sat down at the piano after our church meeting. We only have two weeks left, and I don't know how I'm going to possibly be good enough. This song is tougher than I'd first thought. I just don't have enough strength and richness to my voice, I said, despair trickling into my words. Michael's shoulders slumped. I feel the same way about myself. It's like I'm hitting a wall at this point. Mom poked her head into our family's formal living room. How's the practice time coming? I gave a small moan of desperation. That bad, huh? I feel like I'm never going to be good enough. Mom took a seat in the ivory upholstered armchair that sat in the corner next to the piano. Well, I have good news, she said. I talked to Sister Poff after Cub Scouts tonight about your situation. Rebecca Poff, the choir director at church, was highly trained in opera. She used to sing with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir when she lived in Salt Lake City several years back. She and her husband had moved to Tennessee, and now she was teaching at a university nearby. Her university happened to have one of the best music programs in the state. She offered to give you voice lessons. I told her you only have two weeks left until your auditions, but she's willing to see you twice a week so you can have at least four lessons. For free? The money was so tight there was no way mom and dad could afford to put us in voice lessons right now. She nodded. She owes me a favor. Remember how I helped take care of her mom last year, so she wouldn't have to go in a rest home? So we're really going to train with her? Michael asked. She has an opening in her schedule tomorrow. You'll have to drive across town, but I figured y'all wouldn't mind. Dude. That's awesome. I jumped out of my chair and threw my arms around mom's neck. Thanks so much. I can't believe it. Michael and I made the trip across town after school on Thursday. I sat in the front seat with my music binder on my lap drumming my fingers across the surface of my binder. Although I was excited for the chance to work with Sister Poff, I also had a mass of tangled anxiety in the bottom of my belly. What if I got there, and she realized that I was beyond help? Figuring out parking at the university wasn't helping my anxiety much either. By the time we'd tracked down Sister Poff's office in the music building, I was a bundle of nerves. I was grateful when Michael suggested that I go first. Sister Poff's face lit up when I appeared in her office doorway. She was a large woman with wavy graying hair and a kind, intelligent face. Destiny. Come on in. The tiny room was crowded with a baby grand piano, a medium-sized desk, and a couple of chairs for guests. The walls and shelves around her desk were cluttered with memorabilia from all around the world. Photographs of her posing with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and awards she had won as a voice teacher hung on the walls. Two African masks stared at me from over the piano. I assumed that we would be spending most of our time on my song, but Sister Poff had me start the lesson with something she called lip trills. I sang scales, but blew air through my lips, instead. The intense vibrating began to tickle after a while, and sometimes I ended up sputtering instead. Sister Poff explained that the sputtering meant I wasn't taking deep enough breaths. She went on to teach the importance of breath support and posture. Imagine that you have an inner tube around your waist that you're taking deep breaths into. It's a bit harder for you since you have a smaller frame. But I want you to also imagine that you are standing on a jump rope and holding the ends in each hand. I want you to keep your feet planted onto that jump rope and then imagine you're pulling the rope tight. I did so, and felt much more grounded as I sang. I expanded my breath into my belly, and all around me, circling even to my back, and the sensation felt foreign. I had a lot of practice ahead to retrain myself to this new way of singing. 
After we had gone through about 15 minutes of vocal exercises, we moved on to the song I'd brought. This is a wonderful choice, she said when I took the song out of my binder and set it on the piano in front of her. The Secret Garden is one of my favorite musicals. Have you seen it? I shook my head. You really ought to take the time to look it up. When I began singing, I was surprised to discover how warm my voice was. My vocal cords seemed to move from note to note with ease, and I hit the higher notes with a clarity I usually struggled to achieve. I made a mental note to implement warm-ups into my daily practice time. I've noticed that the back of your tongue is rising up and blocking your airway as you sing, Sister Poff noted when I finished the song. Try keeping the tip of your tongue behind the back of your bottom teeth so that your tongue stays flat. I think you'll notice that you'll have a much clearer sound after making that change. We launched into the song once more, and, although it was hard to keep track of the words and notes, while still remembering to keep the new placement of my tongue, I did notice a distinct difference in my voice. The notes came out with a much richer sound. We ran through the songs two more times before it was time for my lesson to end. As I sat in the hall during Michael's lesson, my head spun with all the changes I needed to make to improve of my sound. It had been difficult to juggle everything I needed to remember. I could support my breath and keep my feet planted, but then I'd forget to keep my tongue behind my teeth. But I was determined to practice hard to begin to form better habits. The next day at lunch, I told Hannah all about my lesson. She sounds like she knows what she's talking about. Care to share your knowledge with the rest of us? Hudson asked. Ooh. You mean like group practices? Hannah asked. We can do it at my house again. I can do what I can to share info with you guys. I don't know how helpful I'll be, but I can do my best, I said. We can set up some practices at my place, too. I bet my mom would be cool with that. I sang more in the next two weeks than I ever had. I'd spent so much time singing that I was beginning to fall behind on my homework, but I was determined to be my best even if it didn't mean I landed a role. At my second lesson, Sister Poff identified that I was keeping my mouth tight as I sang, and her solution was to have me sing with a cork between my teeth to help train my mouth to stay more open. As a result, the notes that flowed from my mouth rang clear. Then she taught me the next step of breathing, which was to pretend that I was sucking air through a straw every time I took a breath. The last week, during our group practices, we focused on acting ability. All of us were solidly memorized, so we had the freedom to walk around the room without being pinned behind a stack of sheet music. Hannah had the most musical theater experience, so she led the practices. We sat around her family room on the couch and we took turns performing, using the space in front of her family's massive TV as our stage. After each performance, we all took a turn giving feedback. I hope y'all don't mind, Hannah piped up, looking from side to side at us sitting on the couch with her but I'm going to be kind of blunt with you. You guys will probably get used to this with me. She grinned. When I give you a piece of criticism, it's a suggestion to help you improve, so try to not get offended by it. We have too much work to do to worry about hurt feelings, right? I nodded and saw Hudson do the same with a glint of determination in his eye. I know critiques can kind of be hard at first, but if you're hoping to land a part, you'll want to pay close attention. Hannah looked straight ahead at Shanice, who had just performed. You need to find a focus. Your eyes are wandering all over the room, and it's really distracting. Oh. And one more thing. Never look at the director once you start your song. The time to look at the director is when you first walk into the room for your audition. Come in with a smile, stop in front of Mr. Bird, and tell him what your name is and what you're performing. That's called slating. It's what Broadway professionals do. Okay, who's up next? Chapter 17, Isaac. Mr. Bird had been teaching me voice lessons for all four of my high school years, and I'd built up quite a portfolio of songs from my time with him. But I had the disadvantage of auditioning with songs that he'd already heard me sing multiple times. I grabbed my laptop and scoured the internet for rarely used audition songs for my vocal range. I picked five songs, clicked the print icon, and headed downstairs to Dad's office to pick up the printed copies. 
After grabbing the copies from the printer, I made my way to the front room and sat down at my family's grand piano. I played through the first few songs, and then pulled up YouTube videos of them on my phone. Once I'd played through all five, the garage door went up, and Josh came home with Dad. Sup, Isaac, he said, eyeing the sheet music I'd been playing with open curiosity. It was unusual for him to be so openly interested in what I was doing. He typically watched what I did from a distance and acted completely disinterested whenever I questioned him about it. But today there was no pretense. Are you working on audition songs? he asked. Yep, I said, scooting down to make a spot for him. I really want to land a role, he said. Think you could help me put something together? I paged through the stack of music. He dropped his backpack on the floor next to the piano bench and took a seat next to me. It had been a while since we'd sat at the piano together, and it brought back memories of a much younger Isaac and Josh playing and singing together. I was the one who'd introduced him to Les Mis years ago, and I'd helped him learn some of the lyrics. He'd loved the musical ever since. It wasn't hard to do. Les Mis was actually my personal favorite. Josh and I played through the audition songs, and by the rest of the evening, we had the songs for our auditions figured out. I closed the piano lid and looked at Josh. You know, you really ought to lay off on teasing Destiny. The multiple wives thing was a bit much. Josh's back stiffened. You really do have a thing for her, don't you? It's not like that, I insisted. She has a boyfriend. Then what's Hannah doing trying to set her up with you? Hannah's just being Hannah. She thought that if I got cast with Destiny then I'd somehow magically fall for Destiny and then break up with Aspen. Magically fall for Destiny? There's nothing magical about that. It sounds to me like you already have, bro, he said, getting up from the bench and slapping me on the back in a brotherly way. I clenched my teeth and wordlessly watched him climb the stairs. I spent my afternoons at either football practice, doing homework, or in front of the piano. Aspen and I got together to practice a few times, but she was growing increasingly distant. She was working more and took longer than normal to answer my texts. I told myself that she was just busy with work and school, but I still had a nagging worry lodged in the back of my mind that something was wrong between us. Every time I brought it up with her, she just brushed it off, like it was nothing. Still, it bothered me. Wilkinson dug a big, grubby hand into Green's bag of Doritos. Green was lounging back in one of the armchairs in my office with his feet propped up on my desk. He swung his family-sized bag of chips away from Wilkinson. Don't ever think about touching my food again. Wilkinson gave him a wide grin. Gotta get my carbs in for the big game. Coach's orders. You know there's a snack machine down the hall, right? Aspen said from her cross-legged perch atop my desk. Her uniform skirt fell back as she shifted to another position on my desk, showing another inch of her thigh. It's not going to kill you to share with the guy, I said with a wry smile, intertwining my fingers with Aspen's. Look at him. He's practically starving. I sat sideways in my desk chair with my legs draped over one of the arms. It's true. Coach has me on a strict 3,000-calorie diet. Destiny passed by the open door with Hudson. Meeting his huge smile, she tossed her curls back and laughed. She was so wrapped up in his antics that she was unaware of her audience. Although, I knew she had a boyfriend, it bugged me that Hudson could make her laugh like that. I hated myself for it. I hated jealous behaviors in others and I certainly didn't like it in myself. Wilkinson said in a mocking voice, Robinson, it looks like you don't have her wrapped around your little finger anymore. Shut up, I snapped. I told you it's not like that. Hey, you agreed to it yourself. What's he talking about? Aspen asked with a razor-sharp edge to her words. I looked at Aspen, praying that she wouldn't kill me in my sleep. It has to do with what we talked about the other day when you brought over barbecue. As soon as I said it, I regretted the words that came from my mouth. I didn't want anyone else to know about the plan to dig up dirt on the Mormons. 
I wasn't exactly proud of it, and I didn't want it to get back to destiny. She was already mad enough at me. Huh? Wilkinson grabbed for another handful of Doritos, but Green swiped the bag away before he could reach inside. I sat up straight in my desk chair. I scrambled to find words to divert the attention from my slip-up. Everyone needs to chill out about destiny. She has a boyfriend. From the corner of my eye, I saw Aspen regarding me with narrowed eyes. Wilkinson jutted a thumb out the door. The guy from the hall? Nah. She's dating some guy from her church. For a moment, the only sound was the bustle from the hall. How do you know? Aspen asked, her eyes still narrowed. Hannah told me. So what's your deal with destiny then? Wilkinson asked. I opened my mouth to lay out another diversion, but Green spoke first. He's running a little investigation. I groaned inwardly. I bet he is. I'd want to investigate that, too, Wilkinson said with a crooked smile, craning his neck to look into the hall as though he was hoping to get another look at her. Not like that, I said through gritted teeth. I stole a glance at Aspen, but she kept her face neutral as she examined her manicure. Green laughed, dusting cheese from his hands. He's just concerned about his cousin. The Mormon girl has been trying to indoctrinate Hannah into her cult, so Robinson is conducting a little research to put together a case we can present to the school board. What's the point of that? Wilkinson screwed up his brow. We're hoping he can gather enough evidence to convince the school board that Bethel is no place for Mormons, Green explained with an impatient tone. Destiny appeared in my mind, standing outside my office door, listening to every word of our conversation. I pictured the pain crossing her face when she'd understood the real reason I'd been approaching her. The destiny in my mind turned away with tears streaming down her face. I bit back a gasp as the force of what I'd done hit me. Chapter 18, Destiny The first Friday of October came quicker than I'd expected. Audition Day I walked to the choir room, clutching my folder of sheet music. How could I ever know sat in the front so I could easily grab it out to give it to the accompanist? Although, I had it completely memorized and knew I was solid, I still felt sick to my stomach. Hannah nudged me. You've got this, girl. I smiled sideways at her, thanks. The door to the choir room had a paper taped to it that read, Les Mis additions will be held in the auditorium. The hall next to the auditorium was littered with Primus members and backpacks. Hannah and I stepped over outstretched legs. Jessie stood near the backstage entry with a clipboard in her hands. Are you guys both auditioning? she asked, eyeing me. I lifted my chin and met her gaze. Yes, we're both auditioning. Jessie scanned the names on her clipboard. Lucky you, Hannah, Jessie said. You get to go first. Hannah beamed, despite Jessie's rude tone. Okay. Destiny, you're near the end of the list. I groaned inwardly. A longer wait meant more time to sit around, feeling nervous. She handed us both information sheets. Fill these out and get them back to me before your audition. I'll call your name out when it's your turn. Hannah and I joined the choir members sitting along the wall and filled out our sheets, listing our past theater experience and availability for practices. My availability was wide open, and I had zero experience. When I turned my paper back into Jessie, it was basically blank other than my basic contact info. Jessie poked her head backstage and then turned back to us, Hannah. He's ready for you. Don't forget to slate. Hannah rolled her eyes and whispered to me, it's like she assumes I've never done this before. I could hear Hannah singing through the door. Like expected, she nailed her song perfectly. We'd practiced it together so many times. I knew she'd be great. She finished her song, and silence fell. I expected her to walk out of the door, but instead, she started another song. My stomach dropped to my feet like I'd just been driven off a cliff in a runaway car. We were supposed to prepare two songs? After all those practices, no one had mentioned that we were supposed to sing two songs? 
I'd noticed Michael and Hudson practicing more than one song, but I hadn't asked them about it because I'd figured that it was because they had wanted more options. Shanice had three or four she could pick from. I felt so stupid. I'd worked so hard all that time on my song, and I could have lined up another with no problem. But I was so focused on making my one song perfect that I hadn't wanted to spread myself too thin. How was I supposed to put together another song within the next 30 minutes? The backstage door opened, and Hannah rushed out. Destiny, we were supposed to prepare two songs. Although my stress levels were still crazy high, part of me felt a little bit better that I wasn't the only one who had missed that detail. Thanks goodness I have so many songs memorized. I was able to pick out a contrasting song from my song collection on the fly and played it off like it was no big deal. What else do you know that you could do in 30 minutes? Nothing, I cried. Literally nothing. Wait, Hannah said. What about Phantom? I thought you said I couldn't do that one. We're just going to have to make it amazing to make up for it, Hannah said with a glint in her eyes. Uh oh. When she got that look on her face, I never knew what was coming next. Adam Jenkins, the loner from the bus, walked up to his locker and spun his combination. Adam, Hannah said. Come here. We need your help. He looked up at her, eyes wide like an innocent rabbit who had just hopped into her headlights. You do? We need to you run the stage lights for us. Can you do that? He stood a little taller and pushed his glasses up. Sure. When? Hannah glanced at the clock in the hall. In about 30 minutes. He shrugged. I guess so. Hannah, I don't even have the music with me. It'll sound horrible without the accompaniment, I said. YouTube, she said like it was a no-brainer. Hudson, can you run the sound booth for us? He grinned, what'll you give me? She punched him square in the stomach. Ow, he howled. I was just kidding. Follow me, Destiny. There's a costume closet behind the stage on the other side of the auditorium. I noticed it the other day. We're going to play a little bit of dress up. How are we going to get in there? I asked. For a moment Hannah's face grew pale like she finally had a hiccup in her brilliant plan, but then Shanice spoke up. I have the key, Shanice said, pulling out her keychain. I'm the teacher's aide for drama this year, remember? Bethel offered after-school jobs to students to help them pay their tuition. Mrs. Wardell won't mind if you borrow a costume as long as you sign it out first. Shanice followed us to the other side of the auditorium and unlocked the closet behind the stage for us. She flipped on a light, illuminating a deep closet lined with costumes. How far back does this go? I asked. It runs the entire length of the stage. The drama department has been collecting costumes back since Bethel was only a church, Shanice explained. They've been running plays for years. A lot of this stuff is biblical clothing, but I know where all the best stuff is. Shanice, are you good to stay and pick out a costume so I can get the sound and lighting guy set up? I'm fine. Shanice waved her away. Go do what you gotta do. Hannah made her way back to the hall, stopping near the door. She grabbed something black, tucked it under her arm, and darted out the door. Chapter 19, Isaac As I walked out of my audition, Hannah rushed up to me. Can you do something for me? She grabbed my arm and led me down the hall, away from the line of students sitting against the wall. When we were out of earshot, she unfurled a black cape, holding it up for me to see. I need you to wear this at the end of Destiny's audition. She pulled out a white mask from under her arm. And this, too. You want me to be the phantom? Isn't this a little bit last minute? I asked. We didn't know we were supposed to audition with two songs and the only other song Destiny knew was Think of Me from Phantom, and since everyone knows it's way bad to audition with overdone songs, we have to make up for it with some extra pizzazz. The hope is that Mr. Bird will be so taken off guard that he won't mind. You know it said audition flyer he passed out in class that we were supposed to prepare two songs, right? I pointed out. 
I didn't notice that, she said dismissively. Most directors only want one song. I shrugged, every director is different. You have to pay attention to their instructions. Are you going to help me or not? This was my chance to make amends with destiny. What do you want me to do? At the end of her song, we're going to have a second spotlight shine on you in the southwest corner of the auditorium as the Phantom to give her a grand finale. Destiny doesn't know, so you have to keep this hush-hush. Spotlight? How did you get a lighting tech so fast? Hannah grinned. I have my people. I took the cape and mask from her. Keep your costume hidden so Destiny doesn't know. It's a surprise for her. Let's go check the list to see how much longer we have until it's Destiny's turn. Hannah checked the list with Jessie and turned to me. She only has two people in front of her. I hope she comes back from the costume closet soon. Seconds after the words left her mouth, Destiny rounded the corner in a sparkling white ball gown with a full skirt. Her wavy hair was swept back from her face and held in place with a matching set of silver combs embedded with rhinestones. Elbow-length gloves covered her hands and arms and glittering teardrops dangled from her ears. I pressed my lips together to keep my jaw from dropping. Isn't that a bit over the top? Aspen muttered from beside me. Whatever it was, it was working for her. I tucked the cape behind my backpack before Destiny could notice. Not that she was paying attention anyway. She and Shanice were deep in conversation. Destiny spun around, looking for her backpack, her skirts swinging behind her. She spotted her backpack and crouched to unzip it, her dress billowing out around her as she retrieved her sheet music. I gaped like a fool and then caught myself before Aspen noticed and I got into even worse trouble. The door opened and Michael exited the stage. Jessie glanced at her clipboard, Destiny? That was my cue. I wrapped the phantom mask in the black cloak and hurried down the hall. I slipped into the auditorium as silently as I could. Destiny walked on stage with the room lit fully just like it was for the rest of us when we auditioned. She handed the accompanist her music and whispered instructions to him before moving to the center of the stage. Hi, I'm Destiny Clark, and I will be performing selections from How Could I Ever Know from The Secret Garden and Think of Me from The Phantom of the Opera. The accompanist gave her an intro, and she began singing. Clear, high notes rang from her throat and filled the entire room. I stood, frozen, mesmerized by her beautiful voice. I hadn't paid much attention to her voice in choir, but she had improved greatly since our practice session at Hannah's. She finished her song, and the room immediately went black. The familiar music of the Phantom of the Opera blasted from the sound system just as the stage lights hit Destiny. Her dress lit up like an expensive cut diamond under jeweler's light. I stared, stunned for a moment, before I remembered I had a job to do. I unwrapped the cloak and draped it across my shoulders. I put the mask on and made my way into the southwest corner of the room where Hannah said the light would hit me. As Destiny hit her high note and the song came to a grand finale, the spotlight hit me from the side. Destiny's smile was radiant when she saw me. I wasn't sure she'd be able to see me past all the stage lights, but I was glad she could. Mr. Bird turned around with an exclamation when he saw me and began clapping and laughing. Well, done. Well done. I have to admit when you said you were singing Phantom I was thinking here we go again, but this was very unexpected. He turned around to look at me again. Who's our Phantom back there, he asked. I took off my mask and took a bow. Isaac. Nice, he laughed. Destiny lifted a hand to her mouth. Mr. Bird turned back to Destiny. Thank you, Destiny. See you in class on Monday. I took off the mask and cape and bundled them under my arm. I exited the auditorium and circled around to the hall where my backpack was. Where were you? Aspen asked. I smiled. Helping a friend. Destiny walked up to us. Thank you. I had no idea you were going to do that. I glanced over my shoulder. Aspen had turned her attention to Will, 
and they were laughing together over something he was showing her on his phone. It was nothing. Hannah put you up to it, didn't she? Yes, but I could have said no. I wanted to do it to help you out. I said. I feel really bad about the hole wrapped around my little finger thing, and I wanted to make it up to you. I should have been kinder and more respectful to you. I am truly sorry for my behavior. It was unacceptable. She searched my face intently with a skeptical look. After a moment she gave me a small nod of acceptance. Thank you. I appreciate that. My face broke out into a wide smile, and an unexpected warmth filled my chest. A sweet smile crossed her features that slowly made its way up to her eyes until they sparkled. In that moment, I vowed to do all I could to make sure she smiled like that as often as possible. The plan was officially off. If Will didn't like it, then too bad. I'd have to find another way to keep Hannah safe. I now understood that I could never do anything to hurt destiny. Not with the way I felt. Come on, Isaac, Josh's words cut into my thoughts. Let's play fair. You know I called dibs on her first. He let loose a raucous peal of laughter. Why would anyone fight over destiny? Jesse scoffed, still clutching her clipboard. Don't feel bad, baby, Josh crooned to Jesse. You can always convert and be wife number five if you feel left out. The more the merrier, right? Jesse made a face. Get a life, Josh. You're such a pig. Dude, that's not okay, I said. Leave Destiny alone. But apparently, she didn't need me to protect her. Josh, Destiny turned to him and looked him straight in the eye. You're not as funny as you think you are. Last time I checked, it was super uncool to hate on someone for their religion, so maybe you should just stop while you're ahead. She turned and walked down the hall with her head held high and her skirts swishing beneath her as regal as any monarch. Her image stayed in my mind, but her words imprinted themselves into my heart. Sure, Josh had been openly picking on her for her religion, but I had been even more active in standing against her religion. She just didn't know it. And I was ashamed to admit that I'd ever felt that way. Chapter 20, Destiny I was done with Josh. Done with letting him bully me. I walked back to the locker room and changed into my uniform. I came back out with the dress draped over one arm to find Shanice so I could put it back into the costume closet. Jesse and Hannah were talking in the hall where I'd last seen them. You really should be careful about trusting Destiny too much, Jesse was saying. The minute you let your guard down, she'll stab you in the back. Before Hannah could answer, I said. Jesse, why do you hate me so much? What did I ever do to you? All I ever tried to do was be your friend, but that was never good enough for you. The words I had been holding in for so long finally poured from my mouth. Yeah, some kind of friend you were. You knew how much I liked Aiden. She clapped a hand over her mouth as though she hadn't meant to say the words. Aiden? What are you talking about? Back in seventh grade, when Jesse and I were inseparable, she'd had the biggest crush on Aiden. He was all she could talk about. She doodled his name in her notebooks instead of paying attention in class and called me every night to analyze whether I thought he liked her back. We'd picked apart his every word. I looked back on that time now and realized how ridiculous we were, but we were only thirteen. It all ended when he had approached me after lunch one day and asked me to go out with him. I was so shocked that I turned and ran away. I was too horrified to tell Jesse, and figured that if I ignored it, the whole problem would go away. But it hadn't. Around the time of the incident with Aiden, Jesse became distant and began forming new friendships. I'd always thought it was because she'd gotten into cheerleading, but now I was beginning to realize that Aiden had been involved. I didn't try to steal Aiden from you. He was the one who came up to me. After all the time Jesse and I spent staring at him from across the lunchroom, he must have thought that I'd been the one crushing on him. But he wasn't my type. I'd only had eyes for Isaac, even back then. She gave a bitter laugh. You expect me to actually believe that? I don't expect you to believe anything, I said calmly. 
and I meant it. For the first time, I realized I didn't need to prove myself to Jesse. I already had an amazing group of friends who had shown me all the support I'd needed today. Hannah, I turned to her with a smile. Have you seen Shanice? I need to get this dress back to the costume closet. I sure have, she said beaming. She's in there waiting for you now. Monday afternoon, the bell rang, and Mr. Bird came out of his office, holding a stack of papers and books of sheet music. I scooted to the edge of my seat. He placed everything on the podium and cleared his throat. After much deliberation, I've finally come up with the leads for our production of Les Miserables. He held up a sheet of paper, pulled out his reading glasses, and perched them on his nose. All right, that's better. We're going for the whole nine yards here. I want to see costumes, choreography, and props. Our main performers will be as follows, Michael Clark, Jean Valjean. I wasn't expecting him to call Michael's name first, but it wasn't a total shock. Michael was a strong singer with a good stage presence. Hudson Brown, in Jalras. I met Hudson's eyes across the room and gave him a thumbs up. Joshua Robinson, Thenardier. Sidney Carter, Madame Thenardier. Will Green, Inspector Javert. The guys around Will high-fived him. Hannah Miller, Fantine. That wasn't a big surprise, considering her past stage experience and her beautiful voice. Isaac Robinson, Marius Pontmercy. Aspen Adams, Cosette. They beamed and looked at each other. Destiny Clark, Apennine. Mr. Bird continued calling names, but my brain stopped registering his words. My heart swelled with pride, and tears began to prick my eyes. All those moments of feeling small and insignificant, the pain I had for my lack of self-confidence had all been for nothing. That one small string of words attaching my name to Epinines had so much impact on my life. I glanced in Isaac's direction and was surprised to see his deep brown eyes fixated on me. A corner of his mouth curved upward into a lopsided smile. I looked back at him, meeting his smile. A note to the reader. Dear reader. Did you enjoy a braver version of me? If so, I'd love it so much if you left a review. I love hearing your thoughts on the series. Also, I'd love to meet you. Visit me on Facebook and say hello, www.facebook.com slash Cindy Ray Hill author. About the author. Cindy Ray Hill loves writing young adult contemporary romance and clean romance. She was born and raised in the hills of Tennessee and has moved all over the United States. She's finally settled down with her family in Utah, but she loves to return to her roots by setting her books in the South. Want to be the first to know about a sale or a new release for Cindy's books? Visit www.cindyrayhale.com to join her newsletter or follow at Cindy Ray Hale on Twitter. Thanks for listening to a braver version of me. Book one of the Destiny Clark saga. Written by Cindy Ray Hale. Text copyright 2019 by Cindy Ray Hale. Production copyright 2022 by Cindy Ray Hale.